um, attempting to coincide with other electoral boundaries, um, such as existing election precincts. And the reason for that is because it makes it easier for the clerk's office when establishing um, the voter zones um, can already has that type of information blocked off. So they have existing voter blocks that um, that map, if that was the way the board decided to go, um, would already have that information and wouldn't be starting from scratch. So with each of those three zones, um, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to each. We can discuss those if you would like. Um, you were provided with updated maps yesterday that contained the racial demographics information that we just received from Arkansas GIS. Um, just a note on that information, that is 2010 data, and that is because the law requires that the zones be based on the most um, recent decennial census data, and the last time that was done was 2010. So that is the data that we are legally required to use, even though, um, you know, seven, nine years later is probably very different. Um, we cannot take that into consideration legally. Now, two years from now, when the 2020 census data is made available, if there are any significant differences or you see anything that is significantly unequal based on racial components and the population data, then the school district at that time would be required to revise these board member zones. But as of now, we must use the 2010 census data. And again, all of that was provided to you along with each map, and, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Mr. Peckron? I think this is less of a question than a comment. I certainly understood what was intended to do with the election precincts. I, mm -hmm. I understand not wanting to overburden the clerk's office, but looking at that as an attorney, I see some districts that have a 4 to 5 percent variance, and I think I don't think a court would allow that to go through. I have some real concerns about those being too uneven. Um, I like the idea, but I don't think as it turned out it's acceptable. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's any tweaking that can be done on that to smooth it out. Um, the DDB district is 4.12% high and the JJE district is 4.99% low. If there's right. any way to smooth those down to closer to two, which I think is closer to what a court would find acceptable, I think. So you're saying uh, it's more appealing to you on the lowest variance as opposed to those that have such a wide variance? Well, I mean, I think, you know, generally the rule for election precinct, election districts is they're supposed to be as even as possible. And I think 5%, which, you know, we've got one that's 5% less than other districts. I think that falls outside the bounds of what a court would find acceptable. And if there are some minor tweaks to a couple of these districts that can be made, I still like the idea of using election precincts if possible. And I think with a couple minor tweaks, that would be the best option. Okay, right, so these are drafts, so um, adjustments can be made um, in discussion and consultation with GIS. Um, to your point about a court, obviously we never know what a court would decide. We did look at past cases and found that 5% was the maximum that they would allow to be and still be considered substantially equal. So that's why we made sure to not go over 5%, but obviously as you pointed out, 4.99 is very close to that number. <laughs> I just, I just think with a couple small tweaks, mm -hmm. you could probably get it a lot closer if possible. Okay. And still not excessively burden the clerks. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I, you, uh, Dr. Moore? Yeah, could, would you mind talking a little bit about the process? So after we talk about today, it's going to go to the cab, what that would look like? Yes. So. Um, we're presenting these to you today, of course, to get your feedback and input. Um, they then will be presented to the Community Advisory Board so that they can, of course, review these and provide input. Um, they will be directed to hold community meetings so that the community can provide feedback as these as well. Um, these are available on the division's website, so if anyone is not able to participate in a community meeting, they can provide um, feedback through the LRSD feedback email that we have established and monitor. 
Um, once all of that information is provided, uh, of course, all of that will be compiled and considered. Um, the commissioner will make the final decision on the final map, and then that will go to the Pulaski County Election Commission for um, approval. That ha they has to be approved by them, and they said that could take them up to two months to do that, given their meeting schedule. And then it goes to the Pulaski County Clerk's Office to get ready for the election. And all of that has to be done before May 3rd so that candidates will know what zone that they could be possible for and begin collecting signatures. That's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I think the only tweak that, that uh, came to mind as I studied this is that uh, rather than the suggestion, because this was our we initiated this to begin with, is that uh, the CAB's uh, input and the public input uh, come to us based on the public feedback and then we make the, the final decision in cooperation with the commissioner but not uh, solely taking us out of it at that point. But, you know, we can talk about that as we go along. Okay? And on to the draft MOU. Ms. Frino and Ms. Hyatt. Lori Frino. As the MOU, which was attached to the agenda reads, I think it's really important that everybody looks at the disclaimer at the bottom in the footnote. This memorandum of agreement is a working draft and has not been reviewed and approved by all proposed parties. This draft will change as we receive feedback from the Little Rock School District community, we're sure, as well as this, this board, the Little Rock School District itself, and the city of Little Rock. So what this is, is this is not intended to be something that's ripe for vote today. What is it, this is intended to be is just like a framework, kind of, a, I keep calling it a skeleton, just something to work off of and um, so I'm just placing it before this board today to, to start the conversation. Excellent. And we would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I had some comments on this. It, to me, it was unfortunate. I understand under FOIA this had to come out. I, was, I thought it was unfortunate that it came out when it did because this MOU was not what I had envisioned last month mm -hmm. when I made my motion. Um, when I made a motion to return the board to local control with an MOU, I, what I had in mind was a few, albeit obviously big picture items I'll mention in a minute, but other than that, that it truly would be local control, that the district... <laughs> you all should probably let me finish before you applaud. But, um, yeah. So, you know, I think, I do think that there are a lot of things in the MOU that are good ideas, but I don't think they're things that we should be dictating. Um, I think there's a lot of good things there in terms of organizing the community to run schools, for example. I'm not sure that at this point, I don't think we as the state board should be continuing to run those schools. Um, at some point, we've got to let the district take control, take charge. What I see is an MOU with a few, what I would call guardrails. This is the part where you probably won't applaud. But um, I see, for example, a guardrail on changing principles. I see a guardrail on recognition of a bargaining unit. I see a guardrail on litigation while they're in level five. And the other thing on that is, you know, I think at some point we have to give this district a clear set of ideas. What do you need to do to get your schools back completely and get out from even under those guardrails? I think the community has felt that we've never done that. At least that's the impression I've gotten. I don't know that that's intentional on anybody's part, but I do think we're at the point now where we need to have a very clear set of exit criteria that are spelled out in this MOU that say, you know, the three things I just laid out if they're met, those are going to be in place while we're under level five. And once level five is lifted, those restrictions will be lifted. But we would also have to tell them what they need to do to get out of level five. I think we need a very clear, understandable set of exit criteria that anybody's grandma could understand. 
I think they need to understand that. Um, but I do think those big important guardrails are important to keep in place while they're in level five. Um, but other than that, I do believe that the district should be in day-to-day -day local control of the local school board with all the support and responsibilities that come to the state under level five. Uh, so what, I'm not planning to make that as a motion today, but what I'd like to see next month is a revised, my sense would be a revised MOU that looks more like that. The one other thing I'd mention is I've heard a lot of discussion about including something in here about charter schools. I don't think that we have a, a board have the legal authority to impose any sort of limit on charter schools. I think we're required by state law to evaluate each application as it comes in on its own merits. I don't think we can artificially agree to any sort of cap. If people want a cap on charter schools, I think that's something that would have to come from the General Assembly and not from this board. Okay. Ms. My, my questions that I had were around the community school model. Um, you know, I had a lot of questions on how it would work and, and members and who would be making decisions. So um, that, that was where my biggest area of, of questions was that I, I was unclear on uh, was, in that, was in that section. Okay, and uh, Mr. Peckron, are, are you, I know we've tried our best to give you everything that we have, but you know there was ex exit criteria, qualitative and quantitative, and you're saying if that is being uh, monitored or adjusted or uh, changing in any way that that be gotten out sooner than later. Well, the, the draft MOU says that the state will work with the district to develop a set of exit criteria. Right whether they're existing criteria that are spelled out or something that's worked on, I think they need to be clearly stated in the MOU and not something that's put not off for a another day. A statement of it, not necessarily change it, but maybe change it, just make sure it's clear. Yeah, I'm not sure what those are. That's, I think those are conversations that we would need to have. Okay. But whatever they are, I think they need to be clear. Ms. Newton, did you have anything for further at no, this moment? That, that's, those were my questions. Dr. Hill? Ms. Dave? Ms. McFetridge? I think my question is, again, working with the PPCs in our schools and making sure that each school is represented on the PPC panel. I think that's, in my heart, that's really important, knowing that there's a teacher in every building that's represented on this committee. Uh, I brought that up. Uh, I did check with uh, uh, districts larger than Little Rock, districts about the same size and districts smaller. And the general consensus from those superintendents would agree with that. I know that the, the date for application or submission uh, has passed, but with a vote of this board, I think we could reopen it. Uh, I think a lot of the teachers who uh, uh, are not a member of LREA are asking that we uh, consider that because they don't think they'll have an opportunity to be on this initial board where the bylaws will be established. So um, I tend to uh, agree with what you're saying. I've, I've seen it work, and I know it works well okay. when everyone's working together. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. So, Mr. Mr. Williamson? Uh, all my concerns have been addressed. Okay, Dr. Moore? Yes, I, I, I think it's a limitation of our model, of, of a board model, in which we can have conversations outside of up here. Um, and so I've been grappling in my head. I haven't had enough time to flesh this out with the department. Um, do, are we, can we have a work session? Should we have a subcommittee? I yes. would like to ask questions yes. of the mayor's office of more staff. And so I don't know if which work session or you know, subcommittee or whatnot, but I would like to have more um, time as we have these discussions. Yeah. I think what I'm hearing everybody say is they would like a work session where we can, can flesh out things and then maybe bring back something for when we have an official meeting to, to do a vote or not. But We'll see how it goes from here. Okay. Uh, Ms. McAdoo? Well, I, I have a, a lot of questions. One, I'm very interested in your definition of community schools. That's the first thing. Secondly, when you were talking about um, PPC and having representation from every school, so are you envisioning 41 people on this body? Like, how does that work? Exactly. Well, I've seen it work. Close to I've seen it work in Springdale. They don't have 40. I believe they have 30. Okay. And it, it works very well. We're 
each member of the PPC committee goes back to their school, shares information, gets the feeling and the vote from that school, and then brings that back to the full committee, they discuss and move forward with the majority vote. So it, it's worked very well. Okay. Well, I, okay. I, I just know that it feels like the board here is just very anti LREA and, and that you felt as though LREA didn't represent, like it only represented the members and that's not how that was. So I don't really see a, a, a very big difference in this model of making sure that people are heard or, or whatever it is that you're exactly yeah, saying. I mean, I think you see that representation in every building. They also worked very well with the Springdale Education Association. So all of them are working together for the same goal, to teach kids. So again, they work with the Education Association and the PPC all together. There was a good feeling there. So. Okay. Anybody else? It's Dr. Uh, Hernandez. Yeah, Dr. Okay. Hernandez can come and talk about the, uh, the community schools because there, there have been some things that have changed since then, since uh, the, the MOU was drafted. There were some uh, national organizations that have been in. I think the Clinton School sponsored one of those events where there was a lot of good information. Um, and to Ms. McAdoo's question about what do you mean by community right. schools, there's uh, we we didn't want and we thought it would be um, irresponsible for us after the motion was made and, and you know, we went back and looked at the transcript to see what we could ascertain from the motion and then went back to the, the public comment periods and other discussions that you all had had to form the basis of, of that draft and again made it very clear as Ms. Freno said that it was a draft, it was a starting point. I mean y'all can throw it out completely but for us to go from October to November and not have anything for you all to look at would, would have been irresponsible. So that's, that's why that draft uh, was, uh, was put forward. As I said, and Dr. Hernandez, uh, Mr. Ballard, and, and some folks uh, from the department were there with uh, uh, LRSD folks. I mean, there was a, a community members at at least one of these events. Um, and then there's been other research done about community schools and that model. And uh, so if uh, you all would allow, I'd like Dr. Hernandez to talk a little bit about that. Yep, so no, uh, Commissioner Key did a great job. Mike Hernandez, uh, Office of Coordinated Support and Service. Uh, so when we did write the MOU, one of the things that we were researching was about community schools. So we went to the Coalition of Community Schools website um, and, and got some components of those things that, that were needed to be incorporated um, as just kind of a starting point. Uh, we then were invited to go to the Clinton School along with Little Rock and, and other community members to learn about a specific model that fits under the umbrella of the Coalition of Community Schools. Uh, specifically, Communities in Schools was the presentation that was done. And so while we were there, it helped us to learn, I think to Ms. McAdoo's point, is what, what, what is the definition of our community schools in, in the model? And so, you know, we brought back the information from that, and there may be some potential site visits to schools that are implementing that model, but it opened our eyes to many more models that are out there. And so, uh, one of the things that, that's kind of up to discussion as the MOU is, is modified is, is that even going to be part of um, the MOU that the state has to have a specific model in that? Um, if that were to happen, or if the district decided to do one, would the district uh, then put out something like a request for proposals? Would that be something that the city would do? Would that be an outside community group that would do that? And so I think we're uh, really flexible in what that looks like. And but just making sure that at least the schools that will be participating do have a model. That way, there's not, you know, multiple ways of doing this and in, in the decision making process and getting lots of feedback to where. The community partners are a big piece of that, and so those community partners know when and how they should be plugged in uh, to working with the schools. And so that, that's kind of the, the latest in terms of, of where we've gone with the community schools part. I think my hesitation is that um, we're talking reconstitution, and uh, uh, do we want to leave the impression that uh, a reconstitution has a community school or 
is that something that the community that comes from the ground up, not from the top down. So I think that was my uh, reaction. I obviously think that there are uh, communities within, and I think that the community and the people at the school uh, can better decide what that looks like for their school than uh, I could, you know, if I go over to Earl, I'd have to have a lot of input, and it's like we heard from Batesville this morning in Independence County, so uh, I think that's when I was thinking reconstitution, community school, is, is that something that a reconstituted district wants to do or a district that's never even been in level five wants to do, so that's sort of where I'm coming from in a lot of the areas. Uh, anybody else? All right. Thank you. I do. I do have one more. Okay. Slide. Yes, Ms. Max. So, just for the record, when I think of community schools, it, it is not where the state tells us what a community school is. Like, it really has to be community has to be a part of the decision making, not well, just you know where you allow them to say this is what they think about X, Y, and Z. And I think I don't know if it was the intent. It's like trying to figure out the intent of legislators when they pass a law. But I think. Uh, on first glance, I thought one thing, and then as I got into it, I think they may be saying, uh, uh, while we're in uh, the a district is in level five, then we want the them to know that the division is there to help, there to provide support, there to do research. You know that, but it, it more than it was them doing it to you. It's like we can help you if 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 needed. That, but, you know, I don't know. We can look through that as we go along. Mr. Pacman? I was just going to say, I, I think what Ms. McAdoo was saying now is what I was trying to articulate a few minutes ago. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, I'm, I think the ideas of these schools of most significant need having all these resources poured in from different locations, from the city, from the state, from the school district, I think that's all great things. I just think at the end of the day, at this point, I don't think we should be steering that ship. I think the school district and the city need to work together and then we serve as a support role and help do whatever we can as the state with the resources that we have to make sure that that gets done. Like uh, pilot projects in, in different districts with PLCs and the different things that have come and then they you know, give us input. This worked really well, this did not work well. And, you know, what you might need at uh, Central might not be, might be different than what we're going to find at Southwest or different from Romine to Washington. And um, then that they, it may have more in common than it has differences. But, uh, you know, get your faith-based community, your boys' clubs, all the, and, the, and the parents, you know, work with them on that. Okay. Uh, next we have okay. before, uh, Mr. Yeah, before we leave Secretary. that topic. Madam Zook, uh, I think the, the department or the division could use some direction. Sure. Um, so whether it's now or whether it's uh, at the end of all the subtopics, I uh, would appreciate, uh, you know, the board. Because last time we had, we, we kind of had to extrapolate what you yeah. all wanted, yeah. all right? And so this discussion has been helpful. But if it is a, a scheduling of a work session or a series of work sessions or something like that, uh, we're... You know, we, we don't know how to modify the MOU at this point um, without a lot more clarity. Well, I agree. And, I agree. And, and, and that is not your or, fault. That or if we even have an MOU, that, right. that is, you know, so, right. so that would be very helpful to us. Okay. I think, you know, I said earlier the three guardrails that I think should be in there. To me, the MOU should basically be the three guardrails, a set of exit criteria, and that's it. It should be on a page. Uh, now then, uh, we didn't have a link for this on the Little Rock attendance zones. This is a result of the court order uh, that was brought by the Covington and the settlement there. Uh, this was not something that was prompted by the state board, but I did ask that uh, someone from this board as well as from the cab be able to give some input and uh, Mr.
Uh, this is a result of the Covington uh, court case that required the Little Rock School District redraw their high school attendance zones and or reconstitute and make them use, tell me exactly the word where you had to make it, uh, draw your zones without making it racially. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I apologize for that. No, good afternoon. Um, I'm Mike Poor, Superintendent of Little Rock Public Schools, and uh, the, I, I believe maybe the word you're looking for is to create a resegregation or to create any kind of racial imbalance uh, and make things worse in terms of uh, yeah. we want to Which have diverse environments. never been environments. the intention of this board ever. Right. So the, what we have, and I, I don't know if the PowerPoint is ready to come up, um, that would be helpful and uh, that will help guide through uh, the slides that I'd like to deliver that kind of give you an idea of, of a model that we will present and then uh, work on that at our community advisory board meeting next week and make that, we'll have all these documents live and public by no later than tomorrow morning um, so that people can access them and, 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 and be able to dive into the, the details of it. So I'll go ahead and, and begin on this. that. Um, the justification, and Ms. Zook, you're correct, that really there's, there's actually two things that are driving the need to modify our attendance lines or making changes to the boundary. The first one is that, um, if you can go ahead and move, advance one slide, please. The you first. Have that at, at your podium. Okay. Well, and, and you'll see in a minute that this gets a little more complicated, that we have to kind of come in and out. So it's actually helpful to have a driver. <laughs> um, the, the first justification is that we have a, a, a blueprint that was approved. And you see that it was approved in both January and February because um, our community advisory board approved it in January. Uh, the commissioner then approved uh, what the blueprint represented in February of 2019. Additionally, the other reason why we needed to do the blueprint is that um, as the opening of, of Southwest High School, uh, one of the things that came up in terms of the agreement was to say that we, were, we would modify our attendance lines. And we knew that we needed to do that um, in, in one respect because of Hall High School, which you'll hear is a, a real key component in all the adjustments that we're going to make in terms of uh, what we're trying to think to improve um, the situation at Hall. If you'll advance to the next slide, the intentions uh, for any kind of attendance zones changes is we don't want to have any form of resegregation. We want to improve feeder patterns, which is something that um, all districts strive for and, and larger districts have a harder time or even districts with growth have a harder time trying to create uh, feeder zone patterns. And so as you review this, that's kind of one of the, st these are all standards that we want to try to uh, fulfill. We also want to enhance school choice options for our parents so that we have more things that make the district attractive. Uh, either to bring in families or to hold on to families. Next, we want to utilize our district resources efficiently, um, especially we have had a loss of students. This year we had less uh, loss than the previous year. You might remember last year was approximately 650 students that we had a decline. This year we're just a little over 100 students where, that we, we lost. And naturally the most important thing then is that we also want to elevate academic performance. If you go to the next slide, this then shows 
a little bit of the, the community blueprint. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny that that was such a dominant um, visual for much of last fall. And now it's probably like, God, wasn't that like five years ago? You know, it, it just tells you how many things that we all think and interact with. Uh, it was a, a process of trying to do a lot uh, with community. I will say up front, uh, whether it's in the blueprint or when looking at attendance zone boundary lines, it's, it's nearly impossible to get to a, uh, an overwhelming majority to say, we love this, okay? Um, and so whether it's trying to, if you're trying to seek an 80% approval or even a 70% approval on attendance lines, I've never seen that be the case. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily the case, it wasn't the case, excuse me, with the community blueprint either. But we did try to go out to the public and we had seven different community means. There were times where um, people got to work in groups, but there also were times where people spoke individually. All that information is captured um, in, in our website. And ultimately, we came up with a blueprint that was presented. The big thing about the blueprint, if you look down at the bottom of that um, kind of the, the colored map, so to speak, is the opening of Southwest High really spurs everything in terms of making changes within the district. Because once Southwest High opens up, it brings Fair and McClellan students into that campus. But it also brings down, as you can see, 300 students that are coming down from Hall and coming into uh, Southwest. Additionally, then, you have to try to work to Let me come up. i interrupt you there. For those who don't live here, that's, uh, before they had the newcomer center for the Hispanic students, so they were taken out of their attendance zone and, and were at Hall, and that will not be necessary going forward. Thank you, and, and, and it, it, please feel free to interrupt me if you'd like. The, the, uh, those 300 students do live in the southwest, and so they actually will be live, going to school in their, their home area. Um, you know, from that, then, you've got to think about what do we do to make Hall stronger. Uh, we also knew that we have growth out in the northwest part of our community. And this year, we opened up an innovation high school. Uh, and it's still being worked on in terms of what that innovation will ultimately look like. We've got the beginning stages uh, going there. We have uh, uh, students that are attending there as ninth graders. Next year, that would advance up to 10th. And then we're making changes uh, to utilize the facilities in a, in a greater way. We don't want FAIR, which is really an excellent campus, to not be utilized. And so you'll, you'll see in just a minute with the attendance lines that we tried to make a K-8 uh, option. Uh, we know that the one K-8 we have right now is successful. Create another K-8 that would be on the west side uh, utilizing the FAIR campus. On the east side, one of the more dramatic changes that we'll see within the boundary is that we have Rockefeller, Washington, and we also have two magnet schools over on the east side of our, our city. And so we were uh, in the blueprint, it was approved to move Rockefeller to being totally a pre-K center and then uh, the Rockefeller students coming over and join Washington. That kind of gives you a little bit of context. There's a lot more, uh, whether it's for you as state board members or those that are listening uh, in the audience or watching this uh, via a feed, uh, that you can access the website and, and see all the components of the blueprint. So and the blueprint was prompted by the district, not by the state board. That is correct. Uh, next is that uh, we'll go to our elementary zones. And I'm going to stop just for a second before we blow it up. But this is where we kind of get into the drive, is this actually shows the existing map for the elementaries. And so in, uh, in just a second, I think we we'll now switch it over to Mike helping navigate this for me so that we flip into a different screen so that we can kind of blow up and enhance uh, certain areas. So with the elementary, um, really, there we go, thank you. With the elementary, the, um, the changes really go back into honoring what we've approved on the blueprint. And so the recommendation here is to, um, if you can see where Romine is, um, and Mike is going to move the, the mouse around that area, if that'll help. Um, Romine is going to join Dodd, which is in the pink. Those are both right in the kind of the middle part of our district on the west side. Those two th campuses will join together to come into the K-8 uh, at FAIR. And so the attendance zone change, so to speak, is to have the Romine Dodd kids come together into one. That's fairly simple in terms of the execution. If you go over to the east side of our community, 
That also is fairly simple in the fact of having Washington uh, go in, excuse me, Washington accept the Rockefeller students. I will take note again that there are actually four elementary schools in that area that represent Washington and Rockefeller. Two of those campuses don't necessarily pop up with attendance zones because they're magnets. Carver is a magnet, as is uh, Booker. And so we have a, a STEM type approach at Carver, a fine arts approach at Booker, and then we're moving the Rockefeller students to Washington. When you move the Rockefeller students to Washington, um, basically what you're doing is that um, we, we know we have a, a large capacity to receive students at Washington. Um, we also know that uh, really when you look at just the, uh, the attendance line and transportation, um, we are not making anything that's a, a, a drastic uh, transportation delivery or, or modification for the students um, because Washington students already are traveling from all over. The Rockefeller students are, are fairly close right there. And we would be able to receive all those students into one campus. Um, if you kind of take it back out just a little bit, Mike, uh, and go to the south. The other thing that, that I will make of note, if you can kind of hover around the Meadow Cliff and baseline area, in the blueprint, um, it was shared that uh, we would like to make another K-8 at the McClellan campus. McClellan is a high school that will no longer have kids next year. But we also know that McClellan's not a good campus. Uh, we also know within the lawsuit, Cloverdale Middle School's down that area, and it was identified as an, our number one priority that we have to do something about in terms of a facility change. So we presented in the blueprint to move forward on a K-8 with both Meadowcliff and Baseline joining with Cloverdale and having that campus there. But that is a, an, one of the areas of the blueprint that you know, a board might make a change on because that is not something that we can execute right now. We do not have the financial resources to move forward on modifying McClellan. We have met with architects. We have a, a facility that I think everyone will be extremely proud of. We've utilized teachers to help us map that out to what they would like at that campus. Uh, we'd want even more community involvement if we choose to move forward with a funding source. We do have a funding source even from the state. We applied for partnership funds uh, at that school, but right now we don't have that dedicated big number. Um, and so that's on a holding pattern and that will be something that the, the board, when it gets seated in 2020, will have to come back to. Is it something where you could move the Cloverdale students to McClellan and as a first step and then if the funding does become available, then make it a K-8 or is, is it McClellan in better shape than Cloverdale? No, I, I personally, I mean that may be a personal thing, but I don't think so. And, and the other thing is that once we get the, the resource, then we would, well, basically we're leveling McClellan to create a brand new school. So um, we would have to have that space and we wouldn't want to move students more than once. Uh, I didn't know that you were leveling it. If we go to the middle school model, Uh, yes, it is. Thank you. And if we'll go back to where the K-8 is, um, really the K-8 um, begins where the, the kind of turquoise green color is because that is our current Henderson attendance zone. And you'll see that the uh, Henderson attendance zone does drop farther south. You can see a green highlighted area that drops south uh, to encompass what is the Dodd attendance zone, so that we bring in the elementary that's already going to go to that school, and so that everyone knows that as they start that K-8 that they have a guarantee to be a part of the K-8 that will be at, at JA Fair. So the attendance zone um, looks like it's a, a fairly large area, but one of the things of note is that if you look, and Mike, if you can kind of show where the interstate is that comes across the central part of our city, and then also show where Markham is, which is just directly north. In that area, um, and you probably have to scroll, there you go. Um, in that area, anything, that the students that we have going to Henderson above Markham 
Right now, there are only 45 students that are accessing Henderson that are above Markham. So that it will be the largest transportation ride for students to come down to uh, J Fair. Um, but we have a limited number of students that, that we're serving. So most of Henderson students uh, that attend the school come from uh, south of the interstate or south of Markham. So that is the, the one adjustment. The second adjustment that we will be presenting uh, to our community advisor board is over at Dunbar. Um, there's a lot of uh, folks that have uh, at different times tried to say, well, the district's not investing in Dunbar. And, that, that really couldn't be farther from the truth. We have invested quite a bit in that campus. It is an older facility, but it's an historic facility, and that's the last thing we would ever want to do to lose that campus. We've worked to try to remediate the issues in the basement. Not to say we don't have problems, but we've taken huge steps there. We've worked on um, you know, the, the roof and the uh, other parts of the campus. We've uh, improved the exterior of that facility. And then with this recommendation, uh, what we're trying to do is, is make Dunbar um, have a, a, a boundary line that we hope makes sense and also creates a better uh, feeder pattern. There's a very little small chunk at the very south west corner, Mike, if you can hover around the, the area where it used to be Cloverdale, so it's the only yellow on the top half where there's that big white space. That, that little area right there contains seven students. But those seven students get shipped down to Cloverdale. So we just think it makes sense. We don't know why that I can't, I can't find anyone that can explain why that little area was initially included for Cloverdale. But we can move those closer and, and have those students have an easier access into Dunbar than going down into Cloverdale. Do, the you, other, do you know why the, the uh, gold color is not touching? The Pulaski Heights area? Uh, well, yeah, I'm going to cover that next. Okay, sorry. So you're, you're just leading me into it. So the, the Pulaski Heights area uh, to the right, that's one of those things that is uh, uh, an attendance zone that, that probably makes people scratch their head like, well, why is it the Pulaski Heights has that whole big stretch in the north and then it goes out and juts out into the east? We actually, under this proposal, will be looking at moving the students from that area that's on the eastern part of uh, the city to be a part of Dunbar. Um, we also know that that area, you know, they, they aren't, all weren't going to Pulaski Heights anyway. Again, we have two f elementaries that are magnets, and so many of the students that are a part of those magnets then matriculate to man. So there's kind of a mix there of students that go to man, and we anticipate that will still happen. Um, no matter what happens, um, even with the number of students right there in that area, um, we would uh, not have a, a major issue in terms of them going into Dunbar. Um, and then and in Pulaski Heights, the other adjustment is that that actually creates just a little bit of space for Pulaski Heights Middle School uh, to take on more students. And Mr. Powell has done a great job um, at Pulaski Heights in terms of building uh, people's belief in the school. We have more people matriculating from uh, the, the schools in the northern part of Jefferson and Forest Park coming into Pulaski Heights than ever before. It's a really strong, diverse school and a good academic school, and uh, so we think it will be fine. So that's the adjustment for the... Mr. Poor. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm right here. I'm sorry. I, I got stuck for a minute. Um, on the other slide, when you were talking about Cloverdale, I thought I heard you mention that it was identified as your number one priority structurally or something to that effect. What did you say would become of the students at Cloverdale in all of this? Are they still going to be at that same building that? I appreciate the clarification. Um, we Cloverdale students will stay at Cloverdale for the time being right now, but we know that that is something that we want to change um, and we want to have uh, Cloverdale students eventually get into a brand new spanking campus that would be at McClellan. Um, if we had the money today, we'd still probably be two years away from being able to open that campus. So um, we're going to have to work on that end of it. And you know, um, the, the effort to go forward to the public to say we need additional resources, I think everybody in our community believes in that that thinks this district needs additional resources. The board that was uh, in place in 2014 did a study 
And at that time, they identified over $300 million worth of needs. Certainly, we've taken a big chunk of those needs and been creative. Um, we also failed in a, an election um, where we tried to extend the debt. Uh, but we need additional resources. Uh, and it's not just for fixing McClellan and fixing Cloverdale. Central has portables. We have uh, growth in the uh, Northwest. We have other campuses that uh, on average age is 60 years of age. And so the reinvestment into these campuses are needed and we're going to eventually need the public to support something like that. Okay, so, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I kind of get stuck. But if I'm hearing you correctly, it was identified, you said around 2014, as needing, as being a high priority. And we're going to, they're still in that same predicament, right? Is that what you're saying? It, well, there like was we're, we're shifting all of these other zones to other buildings because of whatever reasons, but those students are going to still be structurally in the building that has been identified for many years as being a high priority for improvement. Correct, and, okay. and you know one of the things I would tell you is that's why we went for the debt extension was to tackle that. If we'd have received that money, which would have been over 160 million dollars we wouldn't be talking about the Cloverdale and McClellan problem. So, but that did not pass. And so when it didn't, what we had to do is try to work. We did get one thing done, which was even a higher priority than Cloverdale, which was McClellan and having the students at McClellan get to a better campus. Uh, so the, the, the students moving from McClellan to Southwest, that's just going to be a dramatic game changer in terms of the facility that they will inherit. That was the number one priority that was done uh, by the community at that time. If we go now to the, the high school, it's probably the one that will take us just a little bit longer, a little bit more complex to work through. I would like to present three options to you today that we will then present to the community advisory board and to our community. Um, all of the discussions that we're talking about on boundary adjustments would happen at the start of the 2020-21 school year. So the things I'm talking about, this is coming into play for next school year, um, if it's approved. That fits in with what the, uh, the blueprint had also suggested. In this, this document right here, probably the, the linchpin to kind of start to wrap your arms around is Hall High School. And so if you can circle around or kind of open up where Hall is, that in, in this model and subsequent models that will come later, uh, with Hall High School, uh, the, the approach we'd like to have considered is to have Hall become a total magnet school. It would come a magnet school over time gradually, meaning that um, we would, uh, the students that are currently at Hall that are 9th, 10th, and 11th, they would stay and they would maintain the attendance zone but we would start to grandfather in the concept of having a magnet school that would have a STEM and the Ford NGL type focus that we've been working on uh, within the community. The key about creating a magnet at Hall is that we've got to have programming. And that's going to have to take the efforts of a lot of folks to make that something that, that our families, our students say, oh my gosh, that's where I want to be. We would love to have the reality, and a part of this blueprint is to say that uh, this, this design on a boundary adjustment is to allow Forest Heights as a part of the magnet. Any student there would have a uh, guaranteed right to apply and to enter into Hall. Um, if, if, but we, they're not going to go right now, folks, unless we make Hall super attractive. And so there's some work that has to be done. And um, I believe we will get help from the department on that. I believe we'll get help from the, the community on that. And, uh, but that has to be executed. Mr. Poor, can I yes, ask you sir. a quick question? You said it was STEM, and what was the other thing that you said would be the focus of the magnet? Um, also a Ford NGL type concept model. And, and really, I look at that probably in two things that make sense for Hall. One is a technology component um, that would come into that school. And um, because that fits in well with what's already happening at Forest Heights STEM. So we've got to have a, a tech piece on that. And um, what that might mean, that, that's still to be determined. 
The second thing is because of Hall's location next so close to the medical community, um, we've had initial discussions with the chamber, with uh, hospital groups to say, would you be willing? And those have all been very positive to say that they would like to develop that type of programming there. In this model, Parkview still maintains its um, magnet school um, and uh, is a fine arts and science magnet. The central attendance zone under this concept grows by 600, or excuse me, 450. Before I go to the central zone, let me just go to the southwest because it's the cleanest. You can see that the colors of green and blue, that's McClellan and Fair. Obviously, all those students go there. But then we've added one more group, which is where the mouse is covering over right now. And if you look at the interstate there, uh, is to the north on the eastern side of the boundary. That's university that, that heads south. And so that's the eastern boundary is university. And then you take it over to the right, again, the interstate that heads north and south. So we're adding that little group into there. And uh, what that will do is it will um, increase the attendance um, at the new high school, but it also creates a balance then within all the rest of our campuses. The um, area to the very far northwest, I'll hit that and then go back to central. If you look at the very top of the map, you can see that under this one, we basically identified that if you think about Pinnacle View as a high school campus, it's limited right now because we only have a little over 400 seats that are possible because of the space that's available there. So what we tried to do is generate a map that would say, okay, if, <laughs> if we were to just understand the dynamics, how big of, of chunk could we say would be an option zone for people to attend, either Pinnacle or go towards the, the magnet concepts or to go towards Central, that was the line we drew. The rest of that then becomes a wide swath that goes from the, west, the most western edge where it's yellow with Central, and then it would cut all the way across. And remember that that map will become more and more yellow, if you will, the central color, um, as Hall moves forward in terms of becoming a magnet. And I think you, uh, re you uh, spe specified on Hall, but all of the kids that are currently 9th, 10th, and 11th graders would have the option to stay at the school where they currently, the high school where they currently that's, are. That's correct. We want, we want to uh, make sure that we, we do that. Uh, to allow that, that transition for kids to stay within the school that they, they care about. And have you thought about uh, if, if the Pinnacle View 8th graders want to go to 9th and the 9th graders uh, go to 10th and, and grow, uh, since we have a high school where we use portables already, uh, if, if you have more than 400 students that you could uh, put portables there for them? To put portables up in the Pinnacle campus? Uh -huh. Um, we have not explored that at this point, um, and we'll take that in, and, and there may be other community members yeah, that would share I those things. I was contacted that the portables that were used, at, or which are new, except for one year, that were used in Forest City by a charter over there, that they are available for the moving. So I don't know what it costs to move a portable, but, and I know portable isn't ideal, but I also know uh, funding is a concern. Yeah, and it, it kind of goes back in a little bit um, on the bigger funding issue within the district that we really want to get out of the portable business. Um, and, we, and, and I'm not trying to disparage your idea because we know we have a large number of, we have growth going on in the Northwest and we want to try to keep as many students in, in that Northwest area. But the bigger picture really is that we've got to do something, you know, we need to get rid of the portables at Central. And so, you know, that's, that's another factor for us in terms of a, you know, getting our public to be behind it. Um, and, and, you know, that's the, the challenge of the times, right? Because we, we want to, boundaries are just not easy, okay? <laughs> They're just not. Um, but it, it, we want to try to develop strong schools within each of our campuses that, that make parents and kids say, oh, I can't wait to get there. Um, if we go ahead and go to option two. Can I ask one question? Yes, sir. Up? So the pinnacle view that you have drawn there would be what it would look like for a 400 student 9 through 12 high school? Yes. Okay. But I if you go to the next one, it'll give a little bit better, another way to do an option. And there's really no other adjustment on this that you'll see that there's a central zone here that has a red lines going through it. 
And th what that's doing is that if you combine that area then with the, the area that we previously looked at onto the north, you combine those two spots, that actually is Pinnacle View Middle School's attendance zone. So under this idea, what you're, the only thing that's really relevant in terms of difference is that you're trying to say that any b child that's in Pinnacle View Middle School would have the option to either go to Pinnacle View High School or to access either of the magnets or to attend Central. So it becomes kind of an option area, okay? Next, and the very last one, this is one that, that probably, I, I would say, meets the, the bare minimum in terms of adjustments to allow Hall to continue to be strong and also meet the criteria of the lawsuit. So under this one, you still uh, maintain kind of the, all the, the areas that we've talked about. There still would be kind of the, the choice option up in the Northwest for students to go up to, to Pinnacle High School if they want to. They either go there or to Hall or to the Parkview Magnet or try to get in, in Central in terms of its magnet status. This one also has an attendance zone adjustment for Hall. So Hall in this model, option three, is staying a traditional um, high school and not a magnet. It still has its boundary. On this one, we're extending the boundary for Hall. And if you go down the line of where the interstate is that goes from north to south, we are bringing in an area right there that's a part of Central and bringing that into Hall. The second area where we're making an adjustment is over, um, Mike's got it exactly right, on the northeast side. Um, that basically is uh, a, the area right around downtown, uh, bringing that in, and then finally, uh, bringing in the area where Mike's pointing right now. When you bring in all those areas, basically what you've done is recover the students that uh, are leaving Hall that are a part of the uh, program that, uh, for second language students. And so that recovers all those students. So that's the third option uh, that we are going to share um, with community and with the Community Advisory Board. I know there'll be a lot of folks that are going to want to dive deeper into this. So the PowerPoint will get put up. Also, there will be the type of maps that you're seeing right here that will allow you to kind of blow things up and, and look at it a little bit different because it's, it's harder to, to work with it in the PowerPoint just as community members. So y y anybody that wants to access it or you as board members want to access it, you will get the same documents that we are flipping back and forth to so that everyone can have access into um, manipulating those maps. We will have, as a part of the Community Advisory Board, this kind of the same presentation will be delivered. And then we will um, allow uh, community uh, comments, of course. Um, and, and I'm not sure what approach the, the Community Advisory Board will want to go from there, whether they'll want to have other steps that they'll want to take before we have any action or, or how they'll react to it. So we will be presenting this on the 21st. Um, we will continue to make sure that we communicate uh, out and continue to share the plan. And then the other factor that we're kind of in a little bit of a bind on, just to be real with you, is we've kind of got two things that, that smack you up the side of the head to make sure you've got to keep everything moving. One is that this is typically the time in December where we have families really make choice options. That's a tradition within the Little Rock community. And so we've got that uh, that's staring at us. And then we also have... Um, high schools in February, because we now know where everybody, so to, so to speak, is headed, they then go with their master scheduling and push out, allowing students to make the, they're starting to create their schedule um, of what they want to, for classes for the following year. So those are kind of two dynamics that are at the end. Mr. Hill? Uh, um, Tabar, and uh, isn't that on the National Register of Historic Places? Yes. And so, just from a funding standpoint, have you just keep in mind as you're looking at your budget for all of that, the historic tax credits to work on, I mean, at the end of a federal and state, which, which could help you on, on that building if it's there, on the basement, those types, because I know you've done a lot in the community because I've seen it, but I just know sometime in state and federal historic tax credits, you can qualify for those and banks have to use those. Just keep that in mind as something you're working toward that funding source. Thank you. We, we do reap benefits more easily on that with uh, Central High. 
<laughs> we we perceived a lot, but I think right, your but, point but on yeah, Dunbar is good. Dunbar, I, I, I thought I, from something I saw happening over there in the community, that w they would qualify based on that designation as well. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Um So you said you're going to roll out or post. Where, where can the community access this information? And when they are able to access it, will they be able to clearly see the options? And I, the reason I'm asking is because right now, of all of those three scenarios that you, that you shared, the one that, when you talked about Pinnacle View, I kept hearing the different options that those students in that, I think it was the second one, where then they would have an option to go to this zone, or an option to do this, or an option to do this. And I don't recall hearing all of those options for the student, the other, other zones. Well, you know, one of the, I hope I said it in the beginning, but I probably could have done it better, is that, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do um, that was a part of the blueprint and then even with this um, moving forward is trying to create greater options and choices for families um, that will hold on to them. So we already have a great deal of choice within the district um, in terms of uh, magnet opportunities, and we don't want to diminish any of those things. Uh, we want to enhance uh, some situations. You know, you look at, at Hall High, again, kind of one of the linchpins of thinking about, you know, what do we do there? It's had two years of, of growth which is outstanding and, and a real tribute to the staff and to the principal and to the community. But it hasn't, it hasn't brought any new students to it. Okay? We've got to have a different level of programming, a different level of support from the community um, to be able to draw and attract um, even more students into that campus. And so that's kind of the intent. Um, the other things that we have in terms of drawing people in you know, we know that's happening at Central. We know that's happening at, at Parkview. And the excitement that we've seen so far about Southwest, um, especially when we've had kids even go, tr go through the, the new facility, it, it's, it's like it makes you feel really good. I guess what I'm asking is, will the parents be able to readily see their options? Like, will that be very clear to them? I, I don't know if our, I, I, to be frank with you, that's probably something that we're going to have to figure out how to package that a little bit better, and I'll try to have that a little bit better prepared for the, the community advisory board meeting, um, because the current thing that we've worked hard to get to this with just these these set of slides, um, I'll have to give that some thought. Dr. Moore? Yeah. So looking at the three different high school options, is there one in which all students at a middle school would matriculate to the same high school <laughs> that limits that, or is it too difficult and it, it really does not we, we can't guarantee that and um, you know even in a you know you go to Bentville or Springdale even within those two school districts or Rogers <laughs> you don't have clear feeder lines necessarily uh, let alone in a high school in a setting like ours that has five and then you have dramatic differences in the sizes of the schools that create challenges on the feeder patterns because you have some elementaries that are at two, well, 300 uh, to 400 capacity. You have other elementaries like Roberts that are at 900. That's the other extreme, or 1,000 kids. And so, you know, trying to create those feeder patterns aren't as clean. We we think that the new map from elementary to middle school is is much improved, um, and the models that we're talking about for the high school, it's not perfect, but it is better in terms of a feeder pattern. And then, can you speak to? I know so. Currently, Parkview and Central are magnets. Correct. Correct. So this would add Hall. What would what does student selection look like at those three magnets in this proposal? I'm not sure. That I understand so the I, question. I know you have to audition. Oh. You, what, what does that mean? How, how are students? Well, the only one that's uh, right now that's in an audition is at Parkview, um, and the um, uh, so we do not anticipate um, auditions for Hall, but that hasn't got worked out yet because this isn't an approved plan. Okay. But, and so there hasn't been a discussion about what that would look like. It hasn't what? There's no discussion of tacking that on. I have not, and none, none of our team have brought that up. We would like to have something that people are, are saying, we want to come there, and then we end up kind of trying to figure out how to go through a lottery to, uh, uh, to determine who gets in. That would be the ideal. Mr. Porridge, just to follow up on uh, 
something that Ms. McAdoo said. I think, as you explained the one plan, I think some of the confusion may have come up because you said there were four different options for students in that one section, Pinnacle View, Central, or the two magnet schools. To be clear, every student would have options, right? Their attendance zone and then the two magnet schools. So it's that, not four versus one, it's four versus three. Is that, that right? That's actually correct. Um, be, so, you, you know, what we're doing is we're kind of enhancing even another option or choice uh, for parents by making Hall a, a magnet. Okay, thank you. And there would be AP classes everywhere and, you know, opportunities for students to, to not have to get label gifted in order to go. I appreciate you bringing that up for two reasons. One is I do want to share that every one of our campuses ha have those GT programs at the secondary level, both middle school and high school. Um, and second, the other important point about that question is that as a part of the lawsuit, we also had to do everything we possibly could to enhance AP options uh, for the students at, at McClellan and Fair and Hall. And so what we did is we created a, a different delivery in terms of uh, greater access for uh, AP opportunities for all those campuses. We actually, just by creating Southwest, will jump up, doubling more or less the size of AP opportunities inside the buildings uh, when those two campuses combine. And, and the simple reality is, is just you're combining McClellan and Fair that currently ballpark both have about 700 students. So you bring those students together along with 300, all of a sudden it creates a whole different level of staffing. As a former high school principal, you get above 1,500 in capacity. It changes the game in terms of what you can do in terms of your program offerings, everything from GT to uh, performing arts um, and career programs. So if, uh, back to the Ford NGL, if, because uh, uh, I think you mentioned it at Southwest, and you mentioned it at the, at what I'm calling the K-12 magnet for Hall, uh, if I am zoned for Central, or if I am zoned for West High School, uh, will I have an uh, opt-in opportunity to go to a school where there is a Ford NGO problem? The, the challenge at um, Pinnacle is that the campus is limited in terms of size, and so you really can't develop. No, I mean transfer to where there is one. Oh, like absolutely. To to Hall or to go to Southwest if, if my school didn't offer it. Yes, under, under school choice opportunity, yes, you can. The, um, we also know that, that Parkview is looking at, at Ford NGL in terms of what they may want to do to enhance their own science and their own fine arts. Uh, they're, they're an ex exploration of it. Central has kind of been, um, uh, has not moved forward on that at this point in time um, in terms of, of looking at it in, in, in a deeper way, not really looking at it in terms of a new delivery for the 2020 whereas Southwest, Hall um, definitely are, and it looks like probably Parkview will as well. Yeah, I think one thing as I was studying uh, the pattern, which is Nashville, that they're sort of playing off, is that, uh, for example, at Central, there's almost 37% in need of support. And what they discovered is some of those uh, students were needing more reading instruction. They needed uh, more uh, to look at an apprenticeship or an internship, and then that in turn, they had students that went through the program, got a trade, or got a, a licensure, and then they could pay for their own college if they decided to go to college. So I just wanted to be sure that, it, that we were uh, looking at that uh, for, for some of students at schools where they didn't have a program. Yeah. Ms. Dean? Uh, just to go back to Ms. McAdoo's point, that's something that I've also mentioned um, in our family and community engagement is ensuring that our parents um, are made aware of all of the options they have within the school district. So I'd like, um, that's something that we definitely want to focus on. So I'd like to partner with you. Um, you're welcome to, to help us in that endeavor, but I definitely want to make an avenue for our parents to be aware of every option that they have um, in Little Rock School District. And I think on those maps, if you could, if, if they could make it uh, larger to where you can see what streets, you know, or where, because then you know, well, here's where I live, and here are the streets that this includes. I mm -hmm. think that was the, the difficult part for me until I really studied it, so. Uh, well, and, and once, I could share this with the public, once you, you access the map, let's say tomorrow, you will, if you go into the 
as we are kind of toggling back and forth between the things. The PowerPoint doesn't let you do that as easily. But if you go to um, the individual map that will be there, it allows you to blow things up much easier and really be able to go down into a street level to see exactly where maybe your home is or, um, you know, so that's, that's going to be more available and easier for people to see. Okay, let me interrupt. Are you taking care of the house? Miss Chambers got put on hold, <laughs> so we're, we're working on getting her back online. So this is, might be a good time for a short break. Yes, let's do that while we get Miss Chambers back on the line. And uh, if, if, if they have more questions, we'll call you back, and they may have more after the I'm planning to be here the rest of the afternoon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you. Welcome. This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. Please enter your access code followed by the pound sign. Please enter your access code followed by the pound sign. Welcome. This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. Please enter your access code followed by the pound sign. U one seven eight six one. If this is correct, press one. Two. Please wait. You are the first caller. You will be placed on hold until the next caller arrives. <laughs> Welcome. This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. Please enter your access code followed by the pound sign. You entered three. Three. Please wait. You are the first caller. You will be placed on hold until the next caller arrives. <laughs>
Spot.
Thank you for that presentation. What, your next step is to present this to the Community Advisory Board, and then what happens after that? Well, we, we're going to try to educate people as quickly as possible because we are under a little bit of a time crunch of, of what the, the possibilities are, gather the feedback, and then make a final recommendation. Whenever we make a final recommendation, we'll have another chance for community to give feedback to that proposal before we submit it to the commissioner. Okay. Thank you. So if you could um, present it to the CAB at your November meeting, have a couple of weeks for community feedback, then y'all will have a meeting in December, yes? That, that's, that's kind of where we're going. We may want to try to generate an earlier meeting just because of the timing piece on the choice element um, to try to keep everything going. So yeah. that's, that's the little bit of the confines we're under. Yes. So we're, we're all headed to no later than mid-January, parents knowing, principals knowing, scheduling, all of that. At least knowing the school that, that they have as their choice or what their attendance line their tenants, their home attendance line would be. Okay. Anybody else? Just Mr. One, one thing, and uh, the map's not there anymore. I, I, I don't know if they can bring it up, but it doesn't matter. I know you had gotten a lot of feedback, and we've gotten a lot of feedback about the central zone, and, and you kind of briefly talked about it, but could you just reinforce um, what the net effect of those options are on? the Central High School zone. Now, I didn't bring my document up with me, Commissioner. So, I, it, it, first off, it, it, the, the things that make Central attractive maintain itself in terms of uh, its programming and its GT option uh, and its international studies. But under the attendance zone, um, it, it, when the changes, it basically creates uh, for students that, as the lines change, would say, this is now my home, Central. And that may freak everybody out, but the reality is that those students already are selecting Central uh, for their school of choice. So it just actually modifies it. The key again to all this is that we've got to work hard to support Hall uh, to create dramatic program improvements. Okay. And uh, nothing's off the table reconstituting teachers who want to work in STEM, teachers who don't feel they do. So it would be like a if that's the decision, a K-12 STEM starting at Forest Heights and then going over to Hall, if that's what the parents and children chose. Well, I'll frame, and, and you and I have gone back and forth on that before, that in my eyes on the, on the reconstitute is that with the programming that we put in in the ninth grade, whether that comes from the Hall staff or whether that comes from outside staff uh, that, that would come in that, um, with whatever programming is developed, um, we would want to get top talent. That could come from the hall staff itself. So, um, and if, if you do just a broad reconstitution, then that creates a, a different dynamic for the entire district. So I'd be against that, but I'm for making sure that hall uh, gets to pick some staff, um, again, whether it's internal staff folks or those from uh, maybe from elsewhere, uh, to be able to come in and say, boy, I want to teach that because of their excitement about um, a STEM or technology bent or because of the medical. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to call out five names. So if you will uh, line up behind each other. Yesterday, the three who signed up ahead of time were uh, Mr. McAdoo, uh, Joel Fahom, and Daniel Block, LaRon McAdoo, and Elizabeth Deer. Go. If you will state your name uh, for the live streaming public. Yes, my name is Charlie Edward McAdoo. And good afternoon to everyone. As a former school board member, all that has been said here today to me could have been taken care of if we had not been taken off the board with the exception of one dysfunctional board member that I had to work with for a little time. And I'm not going to call any names. If you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. A former a sorority sister of mine, Nora Hurston, we will not be silent. We will 
go through what you've done with us in the disfranchisement of us and what you're doing to the teachers union in such a way, but we would not be silent. We've been marginalized, but we would not be silent. We have been brokenhearted, but we will not be silent. And you might ask, who are the we? Well, the, the we is not just the Little Rock School District. It's not just the people of Little Rock. It's everybody in the whole state. Because every child, every teacher, every community is subject to happen to what happened to us. Of course, what happened to us was you kept moving the goalposts. Every time, uh, and then after you got rid of us, you changed the rules. Uh, God bless you, Ms. McAdoo. But I wouldn't believe nothing any of y'all say up here because I've seen what you've done to me personally. And I've, ta I've taken this personally. And I'm mad as hell being taken off the board. But I just want to let you know that. But no, no disrespect for that. But uh, let me say also that uh, what the state board is doing can happen in any neighborhood. I call it a cancer. I call it a cancer that could spread over this whole state. Think about it medically. That if you're doing something here in Little Rock to the Little Rock School District, to the Little Rock Board, to the Little Rock Teachers Union, it's like a cancer. And it starts spreading. And then Arkansas becomes a, a place that has an educational cancer to it. I would like every child in the state to not be educated by a substitute. A teacher spends more time with your child than you do. I went to a two-room school. I had one teacher for four years. My whole life is based on Miss Young. You she had, had me for seconds. four years. How many? 15, 15 more seconds. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. I leave you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Ms. Fahon. Hello, my name is Joelle Fahoum and I'm a junior from Little Rock Central High School. As a regular competitor on the LRCH debate team, I've learned that you have to speak up and uh, especially when insidious forces try to silence you. We, the state board, do not believe that students are capable of advocating. You believe that we are not smart enough and you believe that you can silence us and our teachers by the revocation of the protective union that protects our interests from special interests. But what you have failed to realize is that the teachers you are hurting are the ones who taught us how to identify those injustices and, and, and fix them. We recognize that each step you take to dismantling the district is a step closer to stripping our chances of a future and we will not let you. I am here today against the wishes of my parents who did not want me to be charged with an unexcused absence because I support my teachers. I am here hoping that you will listen to students since you have ignored teachers, experts, community members, parents, former members of this very board who compel you to return true local control. Do you think we cannot recognize that what you have done is try to gaslight our community into thinking you have actually returned local control? Do you think that we are not capable of sensing the despair that our teachers feel when they are trying to stay strong in the faces of the suppression that you, uh, the suppression of their voices? Do you think we don't understand these issues? I'm asking you today to consider that we, the students of Little Rock School District, are in fact smarter than you could ever imagine, and we are certainly smart enough to recognize that what we have to make our voice that we have to make our voices heard in any way possible. If not at this meeting today, then at the ballot box when we become of age. We will remember that you used us as pawns. We will remember you, are, you should heed the voices of the children and of their teachers. You should listen to us today. Thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth Deer, Leanne Wilson, and Charles Zook will be the next three. Mr. Blanc, you may start. Well, before I begin, I would just like to say I'm keeping track of time just to you know, keep up with consistencies. And um, I would like to acknowledge Mr. Key and thank him for wearing red for Ed today. 
And without any further ado, I will get started. So hello, my name is Daniel Block, and I'm here to set the record straight. Because contrary to the popular, popular belief held by those who are wanting to cause harm to the Little Rock School District, I am not a puppet being controlled by my teachers or my parents. I do not have to be told that what is being done to my school district is wrong and unjust. I know it is. I know it is because I'm a free thinking advocate, a junior at Little Rock, school Little Rock Central High. I'm a debater who, have, who has won many trophies and I'm a future voter. And I'm about to remind this State Board of Education that the only puppets in Arkansas education are the Walton Foundation supported oppressors who force a destructive education agenda onto the teachers and students of the Little Rock School District. You, the members of this board, doubt us students and don't realize that even though you have attempted time and time again to silence and hurt our hardworking public educators, we have still been provided with the necessary training to call you all out on your oppressive and destructive acts against our teachers and students. This board has forced silence upon our teachers in hopes that they can easily kick the teachers of this district in the teeth without being forced to listen to the teachers' demands for better treatment, or as the State Board of Education prefers to call it, disrespectful disruptions. I feel no sympathy for your pain when you feel disrespected by the LRSD community members confronting you and expressing their anger and sadness and pain. Because no matter how much we want and no matter how much we try, we cannot fire you. Because you were not elected by us and you do not represent us. The only form of representation that you possess with this city is virtual representation. And this is something I learned from a public educator. <laughs> we are supposedly represented by you due to the fact that the person who appointed almost all of you is our governor, which the majority of Pulaski County voted not to elect. So if the decisions regarding our school district, including taxes, are made by people we did not elect, which is this board, and the person who appointed this almost entirety of this board did not elect, did not gain 50% plus one of the vote from the county that the district in question sits in, then how is this allowed? How is this allowed that the people of the LRSD are having taxes that they had no say being forced upon them? How is it allowed that this board's reasoning for taxation without rep I actually have 13 seconds remaining. How is it allowed that the board's reasoning for taxing children without representation is that the boards represents all Arkansans, even the minority? Frankly, it is not allowed. It is un-American and it is a weapon to keep it is a violent weapon used by un-American people to keep power in the wealthy and keep it from the minority. And we want local control. Hello, board. My name is Leron McAdoo. I want to love, and I do, everybody. I wish I could like everybody as well. You can call this a poem of sorts. From a transcript of the governor, quote, I never said I was a segregationist. There must be some time for tempers to cool and for intentions to die down and for people to realize that their extreme opposition efforts are futile. Like in the schools in Little Rock, they're becoming a shamble. I can't think of a word hardly suitable, strong enough to describe the conditions in the Little Rock schools at the present time, end quote. Although that was Orville Fabus, it could have been Asa Hutchison, two people noted for being great politicians, two people who used the law to get around and undermine justice for schools, two people who set in motion a crisis in Little Rock. I've heard someone even say, two peas in a pod. Governor, it's on you to be with truth. But I want to appeal to you, Mr. Asa Hutchinson, the one thought to be the puppet master, the ringleader, the orchestrator. What do you want your legacy to be? What light will the book of records shed on you? 
What headlines will history tie you to? How will the national news outlets cover your tenure? Will they lump you alongside the deniers of truth? The ones who did nothing, the bought and paid for, the racists who revealed themselves in 57. Governor, it's on you to be with truth. I hope they say, I pray they say, I wish they say. Before Asa Hutchison decided to run for higher office, he recognized the city of Little Rock wanted to control their own destiny. He did what was right. He understood the government should be we the people, not we tell people. He sided with the will of people, not the bills in deep pockets. He allowed democracy to happen. He allowed for justice to happen. He allowed for the Little Rock School District to have a locally elected school board with full power. Governor, it's on you to understand we march with glory. We march with glory, glory. Hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Ms. Deer, Ms. Deer, and behind uh, Kimberly Crutchfield and Roy Vaughn. Hard to follow that. <laughs> My name is Elizabeth Deere. I'm a licensed certified social worker and a co-chair of the Central Arkansas DSA. Um, this board is an occupation of a school district and is not considered representation of this school district. The fact that you continue to hold these meetings and vote on life-altering agenda items can only mean that we've allowed you to feel emboldened by the echo chamber of your surroundings. I'm here to remind you that we in the community will not slow our efforts to stop your resegregation of our schools and the ignoring of the collective power of people who stand on the higher moral ground. Our children and families deserve our voices. Ms. Wilson. Hi, my name is Leanne Wilson. I'm a parent in the Little Rock School District. I'm also a licensed social, work, social worker in the state. Um, today I want to talk to you guys about trust, transparency, and partnership. These things have been lacking with the LRSD community and the Arkansas State Board. Mrs. Zook, as a mental health professional, you know the most important tool we have is our relationship. It doesn't matter what tool I use with my patients, if I don't have a relationship, I don't have mutual trust with my patient, no change will occur. This is true for anything. People, communities, or organizations all require mutual trust and respect for there to be progress made. The State Board has failed to make a partnership with the community and develop trust. This board will cast blame on the community for that, but the fact is the burden of responsibility is on this board. The board is the one with the power, and any group or person that holds the power holds the responsibility to establish a relationship and build trust and a true progress for progress. A small example is the lack of communication. The recent community meetings uh, are the perfect example for that. I attended the first one at Arkansas Baptist, where a room full of over 200 people were told there would be five questions, three people could answer for a maximum of three minutes. That's not community input. There were postcards for people to write down their comments and an email set up for us to email. Well, how many comments did you get? What did they say? Did people want return to local control or continued state control? This is just one example of the lack of transparency. Ms. Sook, you stated at this meeting there would potentially be another meeting to go over those comments or some sort of posting or notification, but that of course never happened. Um, so you like to state that you guys speak to lots of people in the community, community members, business owners, parents, and they tell you LRSD has lots of problems and do not like the LREA. But how many? What is the majority saying? I don't trust that these aren't just people in your social circle. Another example I'd like to bring up is the Fair Teacher Dismissal Act. This board voted on that to get rid of that for the LRSD last year. And Dr. Moore, I believe you put that motion on the floor. And yet you put that motion on the floor to reinstate it last month at this meeting. What changed? Why is it magically all of a sudden not hurting the Little Rock School District? 
Back to my original post, the lack of trust. You truly want to work with the LRSD community, teachers, educators, and staff? Then put something in motion that looks like it. Schedule real meetings to have real dialogue about what needs to happen. Give the elected board authority and not just a suggestion box for Mr. Key to approve or veto. Thank you. and then we'll have Kimberly Crestfield, Roy Vaughn, Allie Nolan, and uh, Reverend Allen. Come here, boy. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me three minutes to speak. Uh, as a former Spanish teacher, I'm going to teach y'all some Spanish today. Uh, Te conozco bacalao, aunque vengas disfrazado. May 5th, 2015, Johnny Key went on record saying, I've been asked many times about a national search, and my response to that was, we need someone that can bring Arkansas solutions and Little Rock solutions to the Little Rock School District. That means we need someone who has Little Rock roots and Little Rock connections. I can think of no one better than Baker Curris. As we all know now, Mr. Curtis was fired less than a year later, shortly after suggesting a comprehensive data-driven analysis by the State Department of Education before approving expansion of existing charter schools. To my knowledge, no such analysis has ever been done, yet charter schools have been continually approved, even to this day. On August 3rd, he gave you all a document he did not read at the meeting, so I'm going to read part of his conclusion. It's comments to the State Board of Education and the Arkansas Department of Education by Baker Curris. The desire of some for school choice can never overcome the state and federal constitutional requirements for a free, efficient, unitary system of a public education. A community cannot thrive without a unitary system which meets the needs and serves the purposes of all especially those persons of greatest need. Separate but equal systems do not pass constitutional muster. Systems which segregate, isolate, and stigmatize students in protected classes are, unstable, uh, are unsustainable as a matter of law. Furthermore, such a punitive arrangement is abominable. Those are the words, in my opinion, of a moral man and of a thinking man. I do not sense that from this board. I feel like what's in front of me is a bunch of people with an agenda. I feel like y'all know what you're supposed to do, and I feel like you're pretty clumsy often, and we see that. Like when you unanimously voted for the deal that got 2,000 people out at Central, then you came back, and Mr. Peckron seemed so concerned and he made a motion, and without any discussion, unanimous reversal. That is so clumsy and obvious. I mean, we're supposed to believe y'all didn't discuss any of that beforehand? That is ridiculous. And Ms. I see you, Mr. Peckron. Yeah, you never pay attention to the speakers. Anyway. You have 15 seconds. Okay, te conozco bacalao, aunque vengas disfrazado means I see you, although you come disguised, uh, purporting to do something else. I see what you're about. We all see you. Thank you, Thank you, Ms. Crutchfield. After her will be uh, Vicki Hatter and Laura. Alvarez. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Ms. Crutchfield. Again, I am a teacher at Little Rock Central High, a former teacher at McClellan High, and a McClellan alumni. Thank you, Mr. Pecoran, for having, you know, again, a conscious to say the MOU was trash. But the only thing I want to disagree with you about is the exit criteria. The exit criteria needs to be obtainable or applicable to you all not us. You all need to know we will ask for help when we deem it necessary. The LREA, again, speaks for all teachers, Ms. Moore, not just the one that pays dues, okay? If we get a raise, guess who gets a raise? 
everybody. If we get days, guess who gets days? Everybody. everybody, okay? So whether they're in the union, they might not can afford the union, because guess what? They haven't had to raise in five years. Um, go and look at some of the um, classified contracts. Some of them make $20,000 a year. Could you live on $20,000 a year? And that's what we were at the table negotiating when you all put out the negotiations. You didn't want to give them a raise. So guess what? They might can't afford the $30 a month, but they do support us. And the people that come to you, Ms. Zook, that are so adamant that we're doing a bad job, you see all these people here and all those people at the school today, they thought we did a good job. And they came out there and they stood with us. Where are your people? Where are your people? Because you know, when we had the crisis at Little Rock Central, all those racists and those bigots, they were out there. They were out there. And they were not afraid to tell everybody they were racists and bigots. But guess what? Nobody was there today because we're all out here and we're supporting our school district. We're supporting our teachers. And I suggest, you know, if you have a, a conscious, it, and that's mean you're aware and you understand and you're woke. And if you believe in a higher power than yourself, then one day you're gonna meet your maker. And I hope you will be standing on the right side of integrity and humanity. Mr. Mr. Vaughn. How y'all doing? I stand today, um, with a lot of humility before this board, I come with a simple ask, is that you don't punitively uh, penalize teachers for teaching in schools that you consider to be failing. My entire, uh, high, my entire elementary and middle school career was, was done in failing schools. I went to school in Detroit. And in Detroit public schools, uh, teachers in the, in the hood where I grew up, on the east side, often uh, were scrutinized because of our low test scores. But I'll tell you my story as to why my test scores were low. My last two years in Detroit before my mom died, uh, she couldn't work. I lived in a house with no lights, very little water, little heat. There was a nice lady from down the street that allowed us to run an orange extension cord from her house to mine so that we could study by lamplight while we nursed my mother until she passed away. I went to school every day to survive, not just go to school to learn. That's what a lot of our students are dealing with. And it feels like this board is, is penalizing teachers for wanting to help students like me. I teach at Little Rock Central High, but I did my due diligence in doing work at McClellan and also going back and helping in, uh, in those types of communities that raised me. So when I ask you why you would get rid of our teachers union that allows, number one, for teachers to have a voice and speak their truth, because you guys haven't ever asked us what we wanted. You guys have never listened to what we asked for. How now do you expect us to believe that what we're doing here even matters? What you believe is the agenda that you set forward. The teachers of Detroit stood for us in 1992. They took a stand against the tyranny that was above them just like we are. But I ask that you all have a heart here. You guys have shown us no research as to what cause you guys to make this move to say that the union is the problem of this district. I haven't seen that. There's nothing that shows that uh, the teachers are the issues in those buildings. Those teachers go to work every day to make a difference in kids' lives. I've never seen a teacher that says, you know what, I'm going to spend $100,000 to ruin lives. Nobody does that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Allie Noland. I'm a parent of two children in this district. Um, I will get right to the merits. I fundamentally oppose the restrictions that this board is considering placing on a locally elected school board or the guardrails, as Mr. Peckron described them. 
Um, and I want to say that euphemisms like support and guardrails, that is how we talk to children. It is not how we talk to equals and other adults. We're talking about restrictions and prohibitions on an elected body. So let's be clear and have some transparency about what this is. The restrictions, like whether or not we could recognize the union, whether or not we could have hiring and firing authority over personnel, whether we could set our own budget, or this new one about litigation that we've heard for the first time today. Um, those are highly consequential decisions. And I want to point out, in particular, the one about litigation, because that really caught me off guard today. Under this MOU and the plan that you are considering, the state will continue to have its thumb on the district indefinitely until exit criteria are met. So let's imagine a situation where it is four years from now, five years from now, six years, seven years, 10 years from now. If there is a restriction on a locally elected board's ability to engage in litigation, we have no avenue to challenge that and to try to get out from state control. So that is a really big deal. The next thing that I wanna say is that in personal meetings and in writing, in the past weeks, I have suggested to members of this board, to Mr. Key, to Mr. Poor, to other um, people, that there is a really simple way to avoid everything that you saw today. The 10,000 students who missed school, the hundreds of teachers who were out, which is just announced that you are removing the restriction on the elected board's ability to choose whether or not we recognize the union and let everyone work towards those elections as a positive outlet for all of our energy, let's debate the issues and look at this on the substance and on the merits. You all have never given any explanation for why these guardrails or restrictions will increase test scores, will help student growth. How can you put restrictions on an elected board and link them to having us exit level five if you don't explain to us that they are linked to us being in level five? How can you say that removing the bargaining power of the union is going to help us exit level five. You haven't established that. So before you prohibit an elected board from making those decisions, you need to think about why you're doing it. Is, is it for the best interest of the students? The people of this community have the best interest of our students at heart, and we can make decisions for our own children. And that's what we've been asking all the way through this process. So I fundamentally oppose any plan that will put restrictions on an elected school board indefinitely. Thank you. Thank you. Maxine Allen. Good afternoon, board. I'm Reverend Maxine Allen. I'm a United Methodist clergy person. And I know that some of you probably don't believe in lady preachers, just like you don't believe in a union. And so I'm here to remind you uh, that before I was a preacher, I was a member of the Communication Workers of America uh, Union 6507. And so I want to say to you today that as a result of the union, you have lunch breaks, you have weekends, you have paid vacation, you have FMLA, you have sick leave, you have Social Security, and some of y'all I know will need that. You have minimum wage, you have the Civil Rights Act, including those that prohibit employer discrimination. You have an eight-hour work day. You have overtime pay, child labor laws. You have OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. You have a 40-hour work week. You have workers' compensation if you, you get hurt on your job at the school. You have unemployment insurance. You have pensions, you, and the teachers have excellent pensions if you let them work. You have workplace safety guidelines. You have employer health care insurance. You have except in this state, collective bargaining rights for employees. You have wrongful termination uh, laws. You have withholding, uh, taxpayer withholding. You have veterans employment and training service. You have sexual harassment laws. You have holiday pay. You have employer dental life and vision insurance. You have privacy rights. You have military leave. You have the right to strike except here. You have public <laughs> education for children. You have equal pay under Acts 1963 and 2011. You have laws that ended sweatshops in the United States of America so that children could go to public schools and be taught by excellent teachers just like I was. 
just like I was at Charlotte Stevens, just like I was at Dunbar Junior High, just like I was at uh, Little Rock Central High, just like my children were at Forest Heights, just like my children were at Gibbs, just like my children were at Central and McClellan and Parkview. And why you would want to break up a teacher's union is beyond me. I'm a tax-paying grandmother. I, I believe in Jesus. And I pray for you every night that the Lord will send you a vision to do what is right, Dr. Hill. Amen. Amen. I, 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 I really do believe you know what right is. I, I believe you know what it is to, to live under Matthew 25, where you work with the least of these. And I believe that when you lay your head on the pillow every night and try to go to sleep, you see the faces of these children. And so because you see these children every night, my prayer for you today is that you would do the right thing and you know what it is. Amen. Are you Miss Alvarez? I know you're not Vicki Hatter. I see her back there. Right. I just didn't know if they were going to go in sequence. I'm Helen Davis. I've taught school in my lifetime and was a member of the AEA and the NEA. However, I most recently, in terms of public work, retired from the state. Now, I want to say, in a nutshell, you know, that I believe that you all are all intelligent enough to understand and we were asking for complete and total control of the Little Rock School District and recognition of our teachers' organization. Now, everything else, let the district handle it. And you all go on and deal with the rest of the districts in the school in the state that maybe need some of that good support you got. <laughs> Ms. Hatter. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Vicki Hatter, and I'm a parent in the district. So out of my children, um, my children have attended Henderson, uh, Fair, McCollin, Gibbs, Carver, and Horseman and Parkview. Now my oldest son, he have attended what, what, what you all have said are failing schools. He's out of the district now but it was those teachers that believed in him and that went the extra mile. And I think that uh, you all need to value our professionals more than what you guys do. I think you guys need to respect them and to really nilly, in my opinion, to come up with almost a million dollars to hire substitutes to take the place of them today is just, straight up disrespectful and my child as, as well as thousands of other children was not in school today because of it i stand with my educators my, my my child's teachers they went through school they passed the exam that that the state says you have to be certified licensed and certified to teach and for you guys to say that you're willing to put unvetted people in our schools is absolutely ludicrous. And as a parent, I chose to leave, but I did not have my child there. And I think that you guys should at least acknowledge the national attention. You should acknowledge our educators taking a stand and standing up for themselves. Our students who did the sick out our students and parents who stand with our, our educators. So we want, as you guys have been hearing, full control, local control of our school district. There was a huge gap after June 28th of 2020. From June 29th through, from, from sorry, from January 29th of 2020 
through January 1st of 2021, who is gonna be control in, in control of the district? Because you guys have to give it up, right? Because of five years in. So we would like for you guys to make a true motion to return full and local control of our school district. Thank you. Uh, Laura Alvarez, Veronica McLean, Jeff Wood, Deanna McCormick, Your name. Veronica. Okay, Veronica. Uh, Jeff, Deanna, and Brian. Okay, I'm Veronica McLean. Um, I'm a parent. I'm a I'm a product of the LRSD. I've been here several times. Um, I don't really even know what I exactly, what, what I want to say right now. Um, because I feel like you're right and you keep telling us if it's repetitive, but do you get it? <laughs> <laughs> it's repetitive because we're saying it again and again and again because that's what we want. And then you sit up here and you say, are you asking for community feedback on that? But you don't listen. What, what is this? What is it? Is it just a game to y'all? Is it? What's the point of pretending like you care? I would much rather you stop with all the smoke and mirrors and all of that and just put it all out there. Let's quit playing this game. I'm tired of dealing with this. I'm so tired and I know everybody else in this room is with the exception of a few over there. Um, I'm, I'm so angry. I'm so very angry because y'all are not listening. Why? Why not? Why don't you care? What do you get out of this? Well, I think we know a little bit. But not every single one of y'all has to be that way. There has to be something better in some of y'all. So, please, when you say, are you getting community feedback and we're gonna listen to that, actually listen to us, okay? Please. That's it. Ms. Zook, uh, the, the commenters after me, um, I think it was Deanna and Brian and the Bells have asked me to read a statement for them whenever I have that, whenever their name comes up. I want to talk for just a second. My, yeah, that's right. My name is Jeff Wood. I'm the chairman of the Community Advisory Board for the Little Rock School District, but I'm actually here to talk just as a parent of three students in our school district and a proud resident of Northwest Little Rock. We are excited about the discussion that has begun about a West High School in our district. Families all over West Little Rock are excited about this. The, the, the expansion of a West High School began this year with a ninth grade, but there was a little bit of a lackluster uh, response to that because of a late announcement of that ninth grade and because the opportunities that were being offered to the students at that uh, in ninth grade were not uh, we're not very sufficient. Um, this year only 60 out of the approximately 225 students in last year's eighth grade at Pinnacle View Middle School chose to stay on for the ninth grade. But I don't think that that would be the case if next year we installed all grades, nine through 12, and offered a traditional student experience at that location. Traditional student experience including football, basketball, volleyball, cheerleading, band, choir anything else that contributes to the excitement and the fun that students have in their high school years. That is what the families of West Little Rock want. They want community gatherings. They want a mascot. They want rivalries to enjoy. Recent history has shown, 
Recent history has shown us that West Little Rock families are starving for proximate quality education and when they are given these opportunities, they have overwhelmingly responded. Roberts Elementary School is busting at the seams today. Pinnacle View is a resounding success. 10 years ago, the school district hired a consultant that said in 10 years, there'll be approximately 600 students in this West Middle School. Today, in year four, there are over 900 students at Pinnacle View Middle School. Both of those schools are A schools and they are bright spots for the Little Rock School District. According to Metro Plan, <laughs> according to Metro Plan, West Little Rock is the fastest growing area of our city and the center of our town continues to move westward. But Little Rock School District is losing half or more of its students from this part of town to competition when those students get to high school. In fact, the largest zone for West Little Rock is Hall, and only 14 students choose to go to Hall High School. The demand is there, the community involvement is there, and it is time for the supply to be there also. If the Little Rock School District doesn't do that, doesn't meet the supply, then someone else will. More than a more than 100 choice to nearby Robinson High School this year. A new charter school will open in two years. So for Little Rock School District to be competitive, we must meet the demand of that part of town. Thank you. Laura Danforth, Portia Casey, Anika Whitfield, and George Hobbs. Was, was Deanna McCormick next, Ms. Sook? I apologize after yes. me. Oh, um, I see what you're saying. Now. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. Deanna McCormick. Yeah, this, this is a statement from Deanna McCormick. She asked me to read this. She said, my family lives on Cantrell Road between Reservoir and 430. Our home is zoned for McDermott, Henderson, and Hall High School. My two daughters did not attend those schools. Through much prayer and petition to the district, they attended alternate schools in the district. My eldest attended Jefferson Elementary, Horace Mann Middle, and Central High School. She's now enjoying a successful first semester at Oklahoma State University. My youngest attended Fulbright and is now an eighth grader at Pinnacle View Middle School. Her situation is different than my eldest. She has cerebral palsy and her physical limitations create challenges. With the help of a paraprofessional since kindergarten, she has been in typical classrooms and able to keep up with her peers. Ninth grade is on the horizon and I don't know what to do. With the current climate, Hall isn't an option. Parkview, with its focus on performance and science, is not either. The layout of Central makes the school prohibitive for her. Pinnacle's School of Innovation could be appropriate, but attending that school would cause her to miss out on the traditional high school experience that can be so beneficial for our young adults. Please consider families of special needs children also. My daughter deserves options for a safe and effective education, just like any other student. Thank you. Did you have statements from the other three? I do, from, okay. from, uh, from Brian Salerno. Okay. <laughs> there was a precedent set when the uh, uh, social workers had 85 people sign and that person read several statements. This is not a new precedent. This is Mr. Brian Salerno. He writes this to you. He says, our son goes to Pinnacle View Middle School and our daughter to Don Roberts Elementary School, which have both proven to be excellent schools for academics and the quality of the facilities. As a resident of West Little Rock for over 12 years, we have a tough decision ahead of us to decide if we send our son to private high school or go to a public school out of our immediate area. We pay very high taxes and should have the right to a quality education for our children like that at other high schools like Central. We feel we should have a quality facility and staff in West Little Rock for high school to properly educate our children. Thanks, Brian Salerno. Mm -hmm. uh, the do either of the bells have a statement? They do, a combined statement. Okay. Did they all sign their name? Yes. <laughs> Uh, this is from Amy and Mac Bell. They say, we come from a long line of public school teachers in Arkansas and have been requesting proximate secondary schools in West Little Rock for a full decade under both local and state control. Roberts Elementary, 10 years after its approval and too small, which was immediately so full 
that pre-K was killed after just two years. Over a thousand students are educated there today. It took another six years to finally deliver Pinnacle View Middle School. If Roberts' six grades, which have 1,029 students, and Pinnacle View's three grades with 903 students, if they were high schools, they would already be the district's third and fifth largest high schools. Instead, students are forced to scatter to various alternatives, including magnets, charters, and private institutions due to lack of facilities in West Little Rock. Hall is eight and a half miles from Pinnacle View in a different elementary and middle school zone. Central is 13 miles from Pinnacle View, equal in distance to Maumel High School. Robinson High School is Let me two point. You a minute. Sorry. Whoever has the music playing, either exit the room or turn it off. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Robinson High School is 2.8 miles from Pinnacle View and now open for school choice, which has been a relief option for traditional education. Development of homes, businesses, and other civic infrastructures are expanding rapidly in West Little Rock with plans to develop two downtown business districts at Chennault Parkway and Rolling Road and Highway 10 and the Ranch. Currently, a traditional Little Rock School District high school facility does not exist west of I-430, which is comparable in population to the city of Conway. If you wait to expand again, it will cost the district more than the cost of a building. Please act now. Thank you. Laura Danforth, <coughs> Portia Casey, Anika Whitfield, George Hobbs. Hello, Dr. Laura Danforth here. Um, okay, so you told us to stay on topic, um, Ms. Sook, so I am trying to stay on the points for just today. Um, Without looking at your computer, and Ms. McAdoo doesn't get to play, because I know she already knows, can someone please tell me the cornerstone of a community school since that language is being co-opted and kind of thrown around and used a lot? Can anyone tell me the cornerstone of a community school without looking at your computer? The community. No. <laughs> so the cornerstone is to pursue equity um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty disappointed because you guys actually have an excerpt of that cornerstone in the MOU, which tells me, as an educator and as a social scientist, that what was put in this MOU, which Mr. Peck covered, was, was not really looked at by all of you. Um, so, community schools work actively to identify and confront policies, practices, and cultures that keep students of different backgrounds and races from achieving equitable outcomes. Um, the second piece, that's actually here, on, right here, in the MOU. Um, this part that you left out was the sentence after that, which says, community schools proactively and intentionally empower those typically disempowered by barriers to participation. Um, that is not in the MOU, and I think from looking at it, I can see, I can deduce why. So. On the first page of the MOU, under the community schools piece, where it says community schools will have a community school partnership alliance, uh, compromised of community members, staff, parents. But under that bullet, it says each CSPA will have one CAB member, one representative from the DESE, and one rep from the city of Little Rock. So my concern is that those three groups are not at all representative of a community school model. And I would actually like to um, read you what, is, what that is supposed to look like um, so that when we redo this, that it, we can get it right. 39 seconds. So collaborative, co collaborative leadership, so you must nurture shared ownership and shared accountability. Um, specifically, it, a committee for each community school is a representative site-based leadership team made up of families, students, community partners, which are the people that are putting in the wraparound services in the school, um, unions, that's in there, we don't have that, uh, community residents, principal, community school coordinator, usually a social worker that is organizing that process, teachers, school personnel, um, all of whom guide collaborative planning, implementation, and oversight. So there's three indicators that I'll hit very quickly. 
Um, site leadership is, rep the site leadership team must be representative of the school and community. So the representatives from the CSPA, uh, the CAB member, uh, one representative from the DESC and the City of Little Rock appointed person, that does not fit what you are putting forward as a community school model. It, that does not, that is in direct competition with that. Okay, uh, secondly, you. the regularly scheduled meetings agenda and minutes. So ca I do not believe that CAB members, mayoral appointments, and DESC reps want to be responsible for being on these very labor intensive committees. They meet sometimes once and twice a week. Um, this is very serious. This is not a checkbox. Everyone so again, has so the, to, to, so if you will, please step the, aside. and finally, a clear definition of leadership team roles. I'm going to go because go on because Jeff Wood just talked for an hour. So clear definitions of leadership team roles, responsibilities, and empowerment to make decisions. One of the other pillars that of a community school that you guys did not were not able to answer is invest in building trusting relationships. That is absent and that is really disappointing. So if you want to do this well, please listen to Mr. Peckron and scrap this entire process. Uh, good evening. My name is Portia Casey. I am, <coughs> excuse me, I am an alum of a failing school. I hold three degrees with an added certification from the failing school. Um, I am a teacher of a failing school with awesome kids that are extremely intelligent and smart. I am a parent and I am an advocate for the voiceless. Throughout this entire ordeal, I was thinking of uh, trying to think of something meaningful, something thoughtful, something impactful to say, but the only thing I can do is come up with questions. Um, since the takeover, teachers have dealt with so many changes, school closing in urban areas, let's be honest curriculum changes that didn't even have the opportunity to even make a difference, to even ask a teacher if it's working or not working. Um, teacher burnout, I witnessed it almost yesterday. Uh, security changes in our elementary schools, to name a few. We've decided that rotating security is better than an in-house security, and I've witnessed firsthand how dangerous that can be. Two minutes is too long. Um, what started out as six felon schools has rolled into triple that amount under your leadership, your guidance, your watch. So ultimately, you all are responsible for the felon schools, just as you claim we are responsible for our felon schools. So my question is, who grades you? Who gives you your grade? Um, who holds you accountable for your failure? Because ultimately, this is a school. So you guys have failed us. We've done worse under your leadership. Um, but I say that's just, that's just a contradiction. And if we aren't allowed to score you, then who's, who's judging your performance? Because this is what it is, it's a horse and pony show. My last question that I would like to ask amongst you all up here, excluding, Ms. Mac, excluding you, Ms. McAdoo, how many years of teaching, licensed teaching, in the classroom experience do you all have collectively? How many years? Because educators, we know what we deal with on a daily. We know what we need on a daily. We ask our parents on a daily. We ask our students on a daily. What makes you qualified to know what's best for our kids when you all have yet to come up into our classrooms and experience our, what's, what we're walking in daily? We just want to know. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. Anika T. Whitfield. I'm a graduate of Hall High School. I attended Horace Mann. I attended Terry, Franklin, Roman, and Booker. And I want you to know, uh, first of all, I'm going to ask each one of you to put this on your calendars. On December the 6th, De I don't see anybody moving. December the 6th, we are inviting you to an equity bus tour of the Little Rock School District. We want each one of you to come and ride with us, and we're going to take a look at two different schools in the Little Rock School District. I asked this board, and I know Mr. Williamson and Ms. Zook was on the board before when I asked this question, and maybe you were, Ms. Newton, I'm not sure. Not, don't think Ms. Chambers was, but she might have been. I asked you all if you'd ever gone to any of the schools in the Little Rock School District. I asked you if you'd ever gone to the ones that are supposedly uh, 
in distress. I asked you how many times you'd gone to any of those schools that were in distress, and sadly, sadly, maybe one or two people said they'd been. So we're going to offer you this opportunity to go on an equity bus tour with us because as Laura, Dr. Laura Dan, uh, Danforth said to you, the cornerstone of a community school is equity. And guess what the state of Arkansas has not shown ever? Equity in public schools. And so we are holding you all accountable because for some reason the governor felt that you could do this. To get to this point, uh, I absolutely oppose any additional at-large members for the CAB. I served on the CAC. And Mr. Key, uh, you were one of the people who allowed me to serve on, on that committee and I, or on that um, civic advisory. Yes, it was called a committee. Uh, and I was really glad that I had that opportunity because guess what we did? We had multiple, multiple meetings with the community, and we put together a 40-page review of all the works that we did. And guess what you all did as a result of our 40-page response? Zilch. Never listen to any of the recommendations we made about not closing our schools down, about listening to the community, about allowing us to make our own decisions, about reinstating a locally elected school board. You failed to listen to us over and over and over again. That is unacceptable. That is why we will keep coming here. On item number B, as it relates to the Little Rock School District zone, uh, zones, I have a question for you. What is wrong with the current zones that we have? Why are you trying to extend areas? What are you so afraid of? C, the consideration to, of the draft of the MOU. Mr. Keith, thank you so much for saying that it's not a good one. That, we, that you all need to have discussion and have a session and talk about it, and I hope that you absolutely will. But let me also say on the attendant zones that Mr. Poor talked about, not only do we not like the blueprint and think there needs to be a moratorium on that, we also recognize that you keep saying words like local control, but we don't have local control. Because if we had local control, you would not keep trying to make decisions on our behalf. You keep trying to make decisions for us, and that is unacceptable. So on item A, which is the only item, as I understand it, that y'all are going to vote on, I'm asking you, Mr. Peck Ryan, to vote no. Ms. Ch uh, Ms. Uh, Chambers, I'm asking you to vote no. Ms. Newton, I'm asking you to vote no. Mr. Hill, I'm asking you to vote no. Ms. Dean, although you will never look at me unless you give me a mean mug, I'm asking you to vote no. <laughs> Ms. Zook, I'm asking you to vote no. Mr. Key, you don't get to vote. Ms. McFedrick, I'm asking you to vote no. Mr. Williamson, I'm asking you to vote no. Ms. Moore, I'm asking you to vote no. And Ms. Mrs. McAdoo, thank you for being the teacher of the year. You serve us well. <laughs> Uh, my name is George Hops. Um, I'm a school psychology specialist for the district, and you'll be happy because I plan to be pretty brief. Because most of the things that I was going to say, most of the things that I had in mind, have already been said by people far more capable than me, especially the high school students who just said everything on my mind. Uh, so I won't, I won't repeat all that stuff because I know how to follow the rules. Uh, but I did want to point out, I, I wanted to speak to something Ms. Mr. Peckron said earlier uh, regarding the MOU and uh, some of the guardrails and clarifying the, uh, the exit criteria. So that it's plain and simple. Uh, and I really respect that. I really, really hope that's something you guys take seriously. I really, your track record would suggest otherwise. But if we're going to take him at his word, I really, really want to make sure that you guys, when you go to your work sessions and you really, really consider this stuff. I want you to look at those as guardrails. I know you want to use them as a leash, but please, guardrails, local control is something that everybody has set up here. It's something that I want you to be hearing. And it's not
with the LRSD at the schools that we have been involved with have had to do with underfunding and have had to do with the broader effects of poverty, not with local control. The LRSD is stronger when it represents the entire city of Little Rock, the entire community. The LRSD is stronger when it is well funded. It is stronger when the teachers feel heard and supported. It is stronger when all schools that receive public funding are fully answerable to locally elected school boards. And it is stronger when the success of students and schools is measured holistically, not by a single test. As such, I fully support returning the LRSD to local control. I fully support keeping the LRSD unified, and I fully support reinstating the teachers union as well as ending the movement toward charter schools. Yeah. Local schools need local control, and all of our local schools receiving public funding need to be accountable to that local control. Thank you. Who all's tired of sitting through these meetings? I know y'all are. Y'all probably are, and we are too. One thing I wanted to go back over: if you remember, we were here for teacher fair dismissal. Seems like a couple of years ago, when and we had a big crowd, and uh, y'all voted to take that away in Little Rock District. So we left that, and we came back, and then y'all threw out the frameworks, uh, that issue, and then we come back, and you back off the frameworks, but you get you uh, get rid of the union. And then we get out of that, and then you throw out the MOU. And so it's a whiplash effect that you all are creating chaos and disruption for the kids that you say you want to help and for the families that you say you want to help. So in the spirit of what Mr. Pickron said earlier, I hope we don't leave here and the department and the board release another MOU that says the state wants to continue to control the district in every aspect, and we're right back to where we were before we had this meeting. There is a massive amount of distrust between the community and this board. I think y'all realize that. I think some of you see it as, well, it's just a small minority, but in reality, I think I spend as much time in the community as many, more than you all do as I'm elected here. It is a significant amount of distrust. And so on the MOU, let me move quickly. These zones have to be fully vetted or the distrust is going to build. We've got to have meetings on these. We have to have discussions of these. People have to have an opportunity to look at them, or they're not going to trust in the local election that's coming. The MOU has way too much mention of the cab. Do you all realize that the, a large part of the community does not trust the cab? Do you all realize that? Also, the recon in reconstitution, you can't just keep the cab going, in my opinion. That's against the law. You have to reconstitute the board or the administration. And keeping the cab going is not a reconstitution of the district under the law. So establish an interim board. It can include some cab members, but it can include others. And that's what we need to look at, rebuilding the trust and communication. Also, the MOU includes a lot of stuff. There's no reason for the state to have budget control, for the state to have all this control. The district is not in academic distress. It wasn't taken. The district is not in physical distress. It wasn't taken over for physical distress. So we submitted, I've submitted a markup of that, which says I don't see any way around the November election. That's not a popular thing to say here. But I think Allie was exactly right. If you allow us to have an interim board build to an election and give that board full control, then you will see Little Rock make its schools world class. We need a smooth transition. Y'all keep muddy in the water tearing us up with whiplash every time we leave here. We need a smooth transition back to local control for families, for our teachers, a board that can determine whether to, whether to decide whether the union is going to be involved or not. Of course, we believe that a locally elected board would decide they would be involved, right? But who knows what a locally elected board will do? We'll elect them at a general election. Any of you who believe it's going to be one thing or another, or anybody out here thinks that local board is going to be one thing or another, pure speculation. It's a democratic process. It's time for the local people to take back control. Taxation without representation has to end. We don't talk about that enough. And let's get going together. Come on. Thank you, Will. Um, I'm Joyce Elliott. And every time I come down here, I, I just have these flashbacks to my childhood days when I have actually 
and most black people in this state have actually lived under what was nothing less than an apartheid system, where you did not have control of what happened to you, where we did not have control of our schools. We did not have control of whether or not my parents and grandparents voted. I've already lived so much of what's happening to us right now. And for those of you who are, who are fortunate enough not to have lived that and don't even know what it feels like to be a citizen in the United States of America and you pay taxes and you can't determine what's happening in your own town, in your own city, this is not new to me. And I really, really am sorry that it's not new to me. It was not new to me as a child. When I went to school, I was told where to go. I was told to leave a school just because of who I was. And I feel like this is what Little Rock is. There's something different about the way y'all want to treat Little Rock. I don't know what it is, but there's something weird. Just like as a child, I kept trying to figure out why do those people treat my grandparents like that? What, why can't they vote? What are they doing that's so wrong that they get treated one way and other people get treated another way? When all we have done is be born into the world as we are, where all we've done is to be Little Rock. And there's something about Little Rock that it's almost we have a thing for it. And when I look at what the law says, the law does not require you to take control of, of this uh, school district. There are people who think there is a requirement in the law that you have to maintain control of this district. That's not what it says. It says you may. It does not say you must. And you have made for five years here. And you can choose to may Give, turn it back to the people of this district. Just like somebody finally decided to stand up for me and say, when you turn 18, you won't have to suffer what your parents and grandparents had to suffer. If we keep this up, our kids are going to be standing right here talking to you or somebody who inherits your position. I want to say about the attendance zones. If we're going to do everything by the blueprint and the attendance zones, and we've got schools that may be closed, schools that are going to be consolidated, and we keep talking about we're going to make all these changes based on what's in this blueprint and the attendance zones. We are, did you say we got 30 seconds? We could have about 30 seconds if it went off, because you said three, and try to get there. So, so I, will, I, I will be fast, because I, I don't want to be disrespectful to the board, because I don't mean it that way. But we are not, we seems we are not concerned about avoiding segregation. I'm not concerned so much about resegregation at this point is, it seems like nobody, everybody said you didn't know what a race neutral school was. I don't understand how come you don't know that. You know what, that work session? I know what that is. And I would just say on the school board zones, um, please be thoughtful about what Mr. Pickard uh, Pacron said, you know, there's something called packing districts. And what that means is when you pack districts, you put certain people, and generally in this case, it's black folks, pack them into a district where they're all together. And here's what people believe, that we will pack districts and add to so that we can make sure we never have another predominantly black school board. You need to know that's what people see in this. And here's why, because you have never given a single rationale for why we must go from seven to nine. Something that should be done by the elected school board after November 20th if they decide to do that. Thank you so much. And I wanna come here at some point and not have to live flashbacks, because this is not American. Carmen Portillo, yes. Uh, then Marco Dorfman, Dorfman and Johnny Hassan. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carmen Portillo. I am a Little Rock resident. I'm a, um, a 
um, small business owner, successful small business owner, a product of the public school system, and I have a bright, um, full of life uh, kindergartner at Williams Magnet. Um, I don't want to come here to repeat a lot of things because you guys have heard them, your eyes are glazing over, I under, understand. Um, but um, I want to, instead of speaking in generalities, my comment today is for, uh, is directed at Mr. Donnie Key. Mr. Key, I don't know any organization or business that will allow an employee to remain in control that has con considerably failed to do their job. It has been five years since you guys have taken over and since you were appointed by Asa Hutchinson. It's okay to fail. It's okay to move on. You can accept what you couldn't change and you can learn from your mistakes and maybe find a profession that is suitable for you. <laughs> Dr. Hill, you run the Two Fish, Five Loaves ministry at our church, so you know the fish stinks from the head down. I want you to know that pride is concerned about who is right, but humility is concerned about what is right. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marco Dorfsman. I'm a lifetime educator and a Little Rock teacher and parent. Um, over the last five years, this board has made a big number of decisions, the rationale for which has not been obvious. It either doesn't explain or doesn't want to explain why it does certain things. Now, the community has also been speaking to this board for about five years, expressing its desires, it seems to me, quite clearly. And this, this board has not listened to the community. We've listened to what you say, and we've asked, why are you doing that? And we don't hear back an explanation, a rationale, a reasoning and yet the decisions are taken. Now, today, interestingly, there was a lot of concern expressed for those teachers who are not members of LREA for their voice to be heard, and we might even extend the nominating period so that their voice can be heard. It seems to me that every time something happens and the board doesn't like where it's going, we kind of revisit the issue. But every time the community says, hey, wait, this is kind of not okay, we never revisit those. Now, the decertifying of the LREA is one of those examples. That decision was made with no public comment. It came out in by surprise, then it disappeared, then it came out in the chaos of a meeting at the very last minute. People didn't know what happened, and then, oh, by the way, oh, they, re they decertified the union. You guys have the power. Right now, right here, one of you can make a motion to recertify that union. Please do so. Thank you. My time? Yes, please. Assalamu alaikum. I just wanted to explain uh, what Dr. McAdoo said uh, to you when he gave you that greeting. Uh, that greeting is God's peace and blessing be upon you. Uh, he said that at the memorial service at our uh, attorney with uh, John Walker, John W. Walker, who was utilized a few days ago. His son said at St. Mark Church that he would ask the governor 
and the Little Rock School District to be returned to community ownership. That's what John Jr. said, and I quote. So the point of this, that greeting also means uh, a, a greeting of a blessing to those who have deceased. And so when he said it over the, uh, at the church, he was giving John a uh, blessing from God, that only God can give you a blessing of peace. Well, he said it to you, and I hope by y'all conscious that you are not dead. And I hope that you act upon your conscience, and that's my purpose for being here. Two young men, come up. Because y'all have been sitting here patiently, one on one side and one on the other. So patient, they haven't been able to get up. Now, <clears throat> I would suggest that you read the book called Betrayal of American Democracy. It goes a long way in enlightening people about juveniles that have no power, meaning they're not voting, so they have no input into this situation. Many Americans think that is how governing system supposed to work, directed and dominated by elite few. But is, is political systems of privilege and inequality a ranking order that assigns most citizens to an inferior status? In fact, field arguments, expensive expertise are only the route to influencing government decisions. Then by definition, most citizens have no excess. This is a functional reality. This is fairly not democracy. This is capitalism at its most, because most of the time, so the point is for us, the issue of racism, okay? Most of us, you say those who are not guilty of racism, right, become an instrument of our prejudice, which is, by, defined, by definition, is holding on to opinion and making judgment about someone without getting facts or regardless to the facts. Uh, this seconds. behavior is based on attitude and beliefs uh, and uh, most of the time, arrogance. Uh, overt racism, by definition, is placing a institution where overt racism is backseated and replaced by what you call institutional subordination. And that is institutional subordination, excuse me. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't go to college, so y'all can excuse me for that. A place, a place, a placing a person into a position of status of inferiority by your attitudes and actions and your institutional structures, which do not use color or use uh, inferior ideas in sub subordinating a mechanism, but instead of maintain mechanisms that indirect related to color, you say that we are inferior by our race. So my point is that you have uh, the left, left, no school child left behind. This is a document that you supposed to be uh, working on, as the, the says here, requires states to of uh, academic levels, well, I'm, I just want to, for the record, put this on for the record, so that it tells me that you have not did the 100% grade level of math to 2014, reached the goal of 2014, increasing students' proficiency in education. You're not talking about that. I haven't heard nothing talking about this, this gap in our, the difference between our school district. And the other thing is the resegregation of the schools. Your own documents, what I'm saying, your own documents here says that these schools are resegregated. So my point is, put for the record, put these documents, okay, on file and define why these F schools exist and why here A, B schools, all the A, B schools have white students and all the F schools have African American schools. Thank you. Can you define that you. for me? Hello, my name is Jason Bailey. I wanted to speak last time, but y'all guys took way too long, and I had to leave because I'm a teacher, and you like to hold meetings when I'm teaching. So, I'm here to tell you why I'm here today. And Mr. Peckron, I'm so glad you looked up at me because I'm glad that you're paying attention now. I'm here because I overheard two of my students, while we were doing a lab, explain their fears about the resegregation 
of their peers. So I was in this fight December when I watched you roll your eyes as a, as a mother come up here and talked about her domestic violence situation. I was in this fight already. So I'm here today because that lit a fire under me. And the hundreds of people out there chanting are ready to. There is a dangerous and systemic problem that you have, each of you. And that is systemic racism. Please don't let your eyes glaze over, Mr. Williamson. Thank you. We, I told you I'm a teacher. I can look at when you're paying attention. You are planning to divide our district, and we see that. And you may believe that we're throwing this word segregation around as if it means nothing, but to this community, it has a visceral, guttural, historical meaning. Amen. It is the height of your white privilege that you do not understand that that word isn't a buzz term. It strikes, it hurts. I know because I get to see it hurt my children. They're using the term. The world is watching you. Mr. Peckron, Ms. Oida Newton, Mr. Hill, Ms. Dean, who I taught your students, Ms. Zook, Mr. Key, Ms. McFedridge, which I never hear you speak, Mr. Williamson, <laughs> Ms. Moore, and Ms. McAdoo. The world is watching each and every one of you and right next to uh, your name in the papers, there's reserved terms for you. Your actions, your behaviors are going to determine this. Not necessarily what you say today, because we that? know that your words mean almost as much as they do with your actions. Nothing. Nothing. They're empty. Okay? We are one district, we are one voice, and we ain't going anywhere. Thank you. Jeremy, Jeremy Lusk, this uh, Dixie, what's Dixie's last name? And then Molly Humphrey will be our last speaker. I don't know what Dixie's last name is. I'm sorry, I can't read it. It sounds like maybe it's Dixie Fair. Okay, go ahead. So I'm Jeremy Lusk, and since mom's right behind me, I'll say I am Dr. Jeremy Lusk. She wants me to say that. <laughs> Y'all, I'm tired. I'm not nearly as tired as some of these teachers here. My wife is a teacher in the Little Rock School District. She teaches stagecraft at Parkview High School. Anybody want to guess what time she got home from work last night? Anybody got a guess? <coughs> 10. 10 o'clock at night. So everybody go see Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe at Parkview, because she's working real hard on it. <laughs> now, I think the world of her, but she is not an exception. She's the rule, right? To teach our students, to guide and nurture them, our teachers give everything they have and then some. You will not find a more dedicated, caring, loving group of people. So when that group of people stands up and walks out, you know you have failed. You know you have failed to listen. Failed to listen to the people who collectively form the heart of this district. So here I stand repeating to a group of grown adults what I spent last night pleading with a four-year-old, please listen. Right? Listen to your teachers, listen to the parents and the students in this community. <coughs> now I keep coming to these meetings and it's easy to lose hope. But let me give you all some hope. I got him to put on his pajamas last night. <laughs> Miracles do happen. Sometimes people do listen. So I'm gonna hold on to that hope and hope that you will listen to the people who have spent their day here trying to convince you to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Dixie Fair and then Molly Humphreys. Hello. 
My name is Dixie Thayer. <coughs> and it down so we can oh, surely you will have a hard time hearing me. <laughs> I teach first grade at Booker Arts Magnet. I have worked in the school district since 1985. Both of my children graduated from Little Rock Public Schools. And um, actually, I had a dream that I was going to stand before y'all and ask why. Didn't realize it was going to be a nightmare. But, um, and, and my one question that I was going to say was, why? Why? You are the very people that should be our cheerleaders. And is it test scores? It, you can't tell me that and compare my babies to the same children at your three affluent schools. You cannot tell me that the teachers at those three affluent schools work any harder than the teachers at Booker. Yet we have a <laughs> Our school has a letter grade of a D. My babies aren't D students. My babies hadn't lived long enough to be a D at anything. Anything. How many of you have been in in Booker. How many of you have come out and watch our babies in the best school plays that you can imagine? Um, I had a situation one time and I could have been recognized by every union in the world. I could have been making a million dollars. I was well trained in what I did and I had a small group and I had a little fifth grader lay his head down and I said, you know, come on, Jeremy, you've got to sit up, you've got to learn. He said, Miss Fair, he said, I am so tired. There was shooting all night in my neighborhood. I cannot fix that. Those are the kinds of things that affect test scores. Did you just see the recent um, report from DHS about that Arkansas is 49th or 50th? in childhood trauma. Have you, I mean, take some of that into consideration. <laughs> come, come see our school. I, I've always said that if on the very first day of the new legislative session that ASA would let them come and sub, and all of you sub, in one school, at their choice, not at your choice, at our choice, um, or even draw it out of a hat, I don't really care. If you came and subbed in my class one time, one time, this would be a whole different ball game. And you just don't believe in our kids. Come out. Ms. Humphreys, did she have to leave? No. Okay, thank you. All right, that ends um, the uh, public comment. Uh, I think of the things that were on the agenda, there are only two things uh, that ha have a need for a timely decision. Uh, oh, <laughs> I didn't know who was sitting back there. Um, uh, one would be whether or not we um, uh, have the uh, camp expanded so that if we're going to expand it that those people who uh, get selected can be done in December and um, uh, have a chance for um, some training before they start in January. Uh, and the other is uh, whether or not to extend the PPC time so that um, one teacher from each building uh, can uh, be on the PPC. So do I have a motion on either one of those or both? No taxation without representation. No taxation without representation. No taxation without representation. I'm not sure why you're pointing me, but I know how to walk out. No taxation without representation. No taxation without representation.
the board is at recess.
Adams uh, under the the items under no, number 13 with regard to the Little Rock School District reconstitution uh, will uh, be moved till tomorrow morning and uh, we will at that time decide on what points to uh, vote as well as the new business which will be the uh, makeup of the PPC. So without objection, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>